Hi, this is Daniel with Off-Grid Permaculture. You stumbled across the only free off-grid design certificate program anywhere on the net. For a limited time, you will be entitled to receive a free certificate, a physical copy mailed to you suitable for framing that entitles you to both design your own off-grid systems and begin a practice designing off-grid systems for other people. There's nothing else on the internet like this and this will not be available forever. At any moment, even tomorrow, this video could be taken, da taken down and the offer will be rescinded. So make sure you take advantage of it today, right now, and take this course all the way through so you receive your free certificate at the end. You know, it was more than six years ago now that I was, like everybody else, sitting in an office, commuting back and forth to work, thinking there has to be something more to life than this. Every day I'd read in the newspaper, you know, the world is ending. There's so much political strife coming. And since then, it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. I don't think I need to explain to anybody what kind of situation we're in. Something has to change. And for me, sitting there, thinking about it, researching it, finally, I hit upon the one solution that made the most sense. And that is to be proactive. I knew at that moment, I had to get off grid. Now, what exactly is off grid? We're going to go through that in depth in this course, but basically it's taking charge of your life, saying, I don't need to work for the man. I don't need to follow the rules of the HOA. I'm going <clears> to <throat> build a self-sustainable lifestyle where I'm living to the fullest, having the best food possible because I'm growing it myself, living in a way that's more connected to the land, building my own home, taking charge of my own life. And it's been so rewarding, but it's been difficult. I've spent hundreds of hours. I've written over 200,000 words on this, documenting my research. I've spent you know, hours and hours in the library researching, watching YouTube videos, trying to get all the information together to make this a reality. You know, There's thousands of people doing it, but it's just not that well known. And there's tons of books out there, but which ones are the right books? You know, I've read all the books. I've looked at all the, you know, not all, but the majority of the YouTube videos out there that have any merit. And I've compiled together the minimal amount of information here that you need to get going right now. So in five modules with three very special guest teachers, I'm going to take you through the basics of what you need to know to get yourself off grid and help other people get off grid. So if this is the beginning of a profession for you, or it's just you and your family making a move to make your life better, get started with this today. So we've got a lot to cover and I'm going to take you right into the first module where I will teach you what the basics of the off-grid lifestyle are, why we do it, as well as an introduction to off-grid electrical systems. So by the end of this hour, you will learn how to design and implement your own off-grid solar, wind, or hydropower system. So let's get started. So this is a, of course, an entire day about living off-grid. And so I'm going to start by saying a few words about what it actually means to be off-grid. And that's something that I think pulls a lot of weight with people. People hear off-grid and they're excited about it, but it's not something that has like a universal definition. So this is more um, what I think of off-grid and what kind of what we're hoping to promote here today. Um, the first thing is self-sufficiency and resiliency. And I'm going to get into these topics a lot more in depth, but the the issue that we have with our modern society is that everything is becoming increasingly centralized. Um, it doesn't seem like that because we're getting products shipped from China and we're getting our produce from Mexico, but really the, all these things are coming in through increasingly few channels in the United States. In fact, uh, over half of the f uh, food sold in the United States comes through only 20 different grocery chains. And that leaves us incredibly weak, um, both to economic uh, difficulties, environmental difficulties, and anything else that can come up. So off-grid living is a way of combating that and ensuring that our society um, maintains itself. And that is part of the reason why I named my website Off-Grid Permaculture, as in permanent culture. Um, the second thing, of course, is sustainability. And through local production, we're able to maintain uh, much higher levels of sustainability than, ever in, um, than in any other way, especially in dispersed systems. And the third is quality of life. You, you only do this because it's something you enjoy doing, and um, it gives you a lifestyle that is uh, far superior than the, the general nine to five work, work week type um, situation. And that's a lot about what our, my co-presenters will be talking about, Wendy Johnson, and of course, uh, Mark and Lynetta. So the first topic is um, resiliency. So if you take a look here, you'll see uh, a graphic of all the electric grids in the United States, of which there's only a handful. 
And when people say off-grid, a lot of times they're considering, first of all, getting off the power grid. And so what does that mean? Well, in the Western United States here, over, you know, almost half the country is interconnected in one giant system. And what does that mean for us? Well, if you'll uh, watch the news, you'll see that, that the Western grid itself was actually recently hacked and um, potentially could have suffered long-term downtime. It didn't this time, but we don't know exactly how they got in or why they got in. And there's a possibility that all of our systems, all the way that we uh, cool our food in the refrigerators, all the way that we buy everything that we, we buy, the way we heat our homes, everything could be affected by this if we don't take measures to put ourselves in a position where we can handle time off the grid. And the other thing is the food distribution network. This comes from a, a report on how the food distribution network works in the United States. And you'll see there's many different <coughs> positions along the line. It doesn't just go from farmers to uh, consumers. The consumers are, I guess you can't see on there, consumers are here and the farm production is over here. And there's up to seven or eight, depending on how you do it, different steps in between to get the food to you. Now there is actual research done and in the United States we have the capability to grow all of our food within 100 miles of the people that, that consume it for the most part. Um, and so if we move towards that type of a system, we have much less concern about what would happen in a uh, food shortage situation. Here's another uh, thing to consider is the crop distribution in the United States. So each color is, is a different type of crop and where it's grown. And you'll see it doesn't really center around where people are actually living. It centers around the Midwest and uh, Central California. Um, but these crops will grow in many uh, areas that they're just not commercially grown at this time. And that is only really viable in smaller scale production. So we're never going to have giant fields of grain in Washington, but we can grow much more of the calories that we consume locally. And so th this all ties into the idea of a, a resilient system in an abstract sense. So what we've got now is more of a centralized system like on the right to where there's lots of different producers and they're all going into Walmart and then they're coming out in lots of different places. But there's that key central point of fault in the center. Now, the goal is to move to where we're producing less and less that way, but more and more of it's decentralized and eventually distributed to where all over the country, smaller in, you know, individuals, maybe smaller farms are producing and then shipping directly to the uh, consumer nearest to them. Um, so the next goal of a lot of people with off-grid living is sustainability. And so if we look here, you'll see the world GDP um, over the last roughly a million years. And there's a pretty clear exponential spike at the end. And that's where we're seeing all the consumption is this growing peak. And how our economy is situated, this peak um, is essentially mandatory. Even in extreme times of depression, the world economy generally has a 1% or 2% growth rate. It's very rare that the economy will go down. You'll see it one or two times in recent history, you know, since 1900. But the Earth can't sustain that. We have limited resources of every kind. For instance, um, one big thing is, is uh, rare earth metal, excuse me, rare earth minerals, which are essential to almost every bit of technology that we use today. They're used in semiconductors, they're used in batteries, increasingly so, as we go to green options. And, uh, but the, the fact is, we're already starting to run out of new sources for these. I mean, they're, they're plentiful on the Earth's surface, but they're difficult to mine. And um, it's gonna, the more that we progress technologically, the more issues we're gonna have like this. And so the whole of the world's economy will need to transition to a method of production that allows for either stability or reduction depending on the circumstances. And the final one, the most important one really is, is quality of life. Um, if we look here, this is the amount of hours worked uh, per capita in various w uh, Western and developed countries. And the US is second to only South Korea. We're even worse than Japan who has a horrible record for people overworking themselves. Um, and it would be nice through alternate means to get away from the nine to five, from going to a job all the time, which not only is sapping our mentality and sapping our psychology, but it's sapping the world's resources to a way where we can be productive and have fulfilling lives, but more and more locally, you know, from our homes, homes from our homesteads. Um, yeah, so th this just follows in with that. The depression is an ever-increasing phenomenon, and that just goes to show we need to make a change.
And I'm hoping that off-grid is part of that change. So this quote comes from Henry David Thoreau's Walden Pond. Of You've probably um, heard of it or read it, but who knows but if men constructed their dwellings with their own hands and provided foods for themselves and families simply and honestly enough, the poetic faculty would be universally developed as birds universally sing when they are so engaged. So the idea here is that what we do with our lives, how, you know, what our work is, how we apply ourselves constructively throughout the day is a huge impact on who we are as people, like what our creativity is like, um, and how we enjoy our lives. And if we're able to start producing the things that we actually need to survive, you know, our food, our electricity, our heat, our clothes, potentially, um, more and more through ways that we enjoy, more and more sustainably as well, then we'll have a more fulfilling life. So why is it up to us to do this? You know, why are we in this room doing it? Why isn't, you know, the guys over at Tesla or SpaceX dealing with this problem? Well, probably because they can't. And uh, here's a short story about that. Of course, you probably recognize the Wright brothers on the left there and their famous flying machine. But on the right, you've probably never heard of Samuel Langley, even though in his day he was much more famous than them. He was actually an early um, flight pioneer. He was the president of the Smithsonian. Um, and when he worked on his flight as a well-known physicist, his uh, flight uh, uh, experiments here, he was well funded by the US government. And they, everybody thought in around the world that this would be the man who would develop flight. And in fact, he was one of many. There was people in France, all over Europe, doing the same thing, who were well-known scientists, who had backings of governments, trying to develop powered flight. And none of them succeeded. His flying machine never was able to even take off, and he had way better conditions than the Wright brothers did. What it took was two uh, machinists make in a bicycle shop doing it on their spare time that's the kind of people that, that make successful transitions. W when it takes a big uh, mental leap to get somewhere, it has to come from the ground up. It never comes from the top down. And here's another example. These two men invented the internet, as we know it. But everybody thought that it would not be those two. In fact, there was a large group all over Europe of telephone experts who were working for decades to develop the inter an internet protocol, which would be the world's networking protocol. And after um, I believe almost a decade of going in, writing these proofs, developing the system. Um, these two sat in their office, uh, they worked for the, the government, but, and they developed a system for the government that slowly became the internet that, that we know today. And it was just these two men instead of a committee of 100 experts. So why is it that we can't be the ones to do that here? It could be, you know, two people in this room or 10 people in this room or even 100, but people working on their own in their garages that develop the social technology as well as the actual technology to convert ourselves into a more off-grid and sustainable uh, way of living. So just to follow it up, you must be the change that you want to see in the world. Everybody's heard that. But I'm glad to see everybody here uh, you know, doing a little bit to make that a reality. OK, so before we get started with the actual um, low-cost off-grid energy systems, which I'm going to go through uh, as much as I can in the time that I have uh, allotted to me, I'm going to go a little bit into an introduction of just general electricity terms. I'm not sure what everybody's uh, level is. Um, so this stuff is absolutely essential to know um, if you're going to be dealing with any type of wiring or electrical systems. And so I hope that you can indulge me a little bit. I won't go uh, too into the technical and educational depth of this. So um, the first thing to know is that energy always has to flow in a circle. So you've already seen that. There's the two wires. You connect your battery. It has two ends. Um, and so this is just a really simple diagram of that. The, generally, we consider the, electro, the current um, or the flow of electricity go from the positive side around to whatever load there is and through the battery. And even just one single switch in that path will cause the energy not to flow, and the system won't work. And even in larger scale systems, uh, like this one here, which is a, a diagram of the uh, US power grid and how that goes and all the different levels that it takes, the energy is always flows from the power plant through the lines around and then actually into the ground and back. So there's always that circuit that exists. The second thing to know is the difference between AC and DC power. So DC stands for direct current. And all that means is that the flow of the current, the flow of the electrons, is always going in the same direction. It may be speeding up or slowing down, um, but it always goes the same way. 
and alternating current is where the electrons actually go roughly equally back and forth. And of course, AC is what we use in the wall sockets normally, and DC is something you'd see in batteries. So DC is actually growing um, more and more important. This, uh, the, the, original, the original discussion about AC and DC actually goes all the way back to the beginning. It's a pretty well-known story that Thomas Edison was a big proponent of DC and that uh, Nikola Tesla was a big proponent of AC. AC ended up winning out um, for general usage because it transmits better over longer distances, and it has one really important use, which is motors. But DC, over time, is growing more and more important, and the reality is probably 90% of the stuff that you use on a daily basis runs DC. So lights are increasingly DC, all LEDs are, run DC. So even though you may screw that light bulb into a, a, an AC socket, inside of this, there is an AC to DC converter that converts it to DC. Um, batteries are all DC, they only can work that way. Computers internally run DC, all your phones, anything that has one of these, um, pretty much all of those convert power to DC. And of course, solar panels only produce DC power as well. Now, AC um, is what you see in wall sockets and is pretty much indispensable in two places. One is which is motors. Now, of course, we're getting more and more into using with, uh, our high power DC motors. So really, you're providing them with DC, but they're turning it into AC inside the motor itself, which is fine. Um, but the still, even still, the highest power motors that we have are all AC. If anything with a bump on the side like that is going to be an AC motor. The other thing is generators, um, like that solar or that wind generator there, which I have an example of here if you guys want to take a look at that later. Um, there are DC generators, but they're very rarely used. So like this one is technically DC, but it actually produces AC internally and converts it. So very common that you're going to run into AC motors um, for AC, even if you're doing it for a DC power system. And then the other thing is, is transforming power. So that's a transform on the bottom right. There are situations where you do need AC power for transformation. Um, but more and more, there's now that we have really smart chips that are extremely cheap, um, there is extremely cheap online. You can get DC to DC power converters, which do all that transformation internally. So the takeaway of this is more and more, we don't even need AC we can just go straight to DC. Um, so the next concept is the idea of electrical potential or voltage. And the way I like to, to explain that to people is it's basically like water pressure. It's very similar mathematically how it works. And it's more like the electrical field pressure, if you will, of, of the current. So generally as measured in volts, you'll see it on, as a V on your um, multimeters. And um, one thing to realize is that AC voltage and DC voltage is measured differently. And so usually it's shown either with a straight line for, for DC and an alter, you know, up and down squiggly line for AC. And there's actually multiple ways to measure um, AC voltage. And the two most common are RMS, which is the one you see almost all the time, which is actually you're only measuring part of the, the actual magnitude of it. But it's for mathematical reasons that's more convenient or the, the peak value, or sometimes peak to peak. Um, but if you're ever reading an AC voltage off of the back of a um, piece of equipment or you're designing something, you need to know which one is which, because if you mix them up, you will do it incorrectly. So here's a, a, an example of some common voltages you'll find in the wild. So about one and a half volts for a you know, smaller uh, battery. Five volts is the standard for USB. So all of your smart devices run off five volts, or at least take five volts in. Uh, 12 volt for so off, you know, solar batteries, car batteries is extremely common, um, 120 at the sockets, and then for larger appliances, 240. All right, the next concept is the idea of electrical current, or amps. And amps is a lot like flow rate in a water system. So it's just how much charge is going through the wires. Um, and so here's an idea of what kind of amperages you'll see on a daily basis. So that actually should say 500 on the left. Uh, 500 milliamps is standard for USBs. A lot of, in of your in-house uh, wall socket circuits were going to be around 20 amps, and then you can get to 30 or 50 for the larger appliances. All right. And so here's a concept that comes up later in how we wire um, the whole system as, as well as the solar panels. And uh, th this is um, very important to know. So on the left is the series connections. And the series connection is basically like a string of Christmas lights. So each thing is connected one tail goes to the next, to the next, to the next. And with a series connection, you're actually adding the voltages if you're doing, um, adding a power source. So like when we're doing the solar panels, you're adding up the voltages, um, but the current stays the same. 
Now the other possible way of doing this is with parallel connection to where both leads on each side are connected together. And so in that case, the voltage stays the same. Like you can see pretty well that you know, the voltage across here and here has to be the same because they're connected together. So the current, um, if you're talking about solar panels or something like that where you're generating power, you're adding the currents in that case. So series, you add the voltages. Parallel, you're adding the currents. So here's really what we're looking for with all this. Voltage and current are important for knowing how to set up your system, but really what you want is power, and that's measured in watts. So you may have also heard of the term horsepower, which is more common in motors or cars. And uh, this just shows what a horsepower is. So one second to lift 550 pounds one foot. Um, kind of a strange definition, but there it is. And that one horsepower is around 650 watts. So if you're looking to a lot of times you're going to see, like on the back of equipment, you'll see different ratings, and they'll say the voltage rating, the current rating, and or the watt rating. And so you need to know how to be able to go back and forth. And it's really simple. You multiply volts times amps, and you get watts. So you need to be careful with that. They need to be in the same units. So sometimes you'll see things with a, you know, with a small m before, so milli, that's one thousandth of one. So you need to divide that by a thousand. Uh, later on, we'll see the kilo, kilo or kilo, uh, with a K in front of them. That's 1,000 of those. So you'll need to multiply it by 1,000 before you do this. And then, of course, you can use this equation to go, go other ways. So if you know the watts and you know the volts and you need to get the amps, you can just divide um, watts by volts and you get amps. So. so here's an idea of kind of the range of what we're looking at. So smaller devices, um, lamps, as we'll see, are about you know, roughly tens of watts. Um, Medium-sized appliances, computers, generally in hundreds of watts, unless you're a gamer. Um, and then larger appliances, generally in thousands of watts. So it's not uncommon for a space heater to be over 1,000 watts. And then, you know, of course, large uh, stoves, even though that's a gas stove, uh, can, if it were electric, can get much higher than that. And then, so here's the money one, watts, hours. So you're going to see this on your power bill. This is really what you're paying for with an electric system. And that's just multiplying the amount of watts that you're using by the time you're using it. So if you're using 100 watts, but only for half an hour, you're billed for 50 watt hours. Um, <clears throat> and you'll also see very similarly related concept, which is amp hours on batteries. And so since batteries have a fixed voltage, or pretty close to the fixed, if you multiply it by that voltage, you get the watt hours. OK, so now we're moving into the actual process. How do I know what I need to get? How big of a system do I need? Um, and how many solar panels do I need, which is usually the first question. But really, you don't want to go from that um, direction. It's much easier to go from what am I using, what power do I need, and then work your way back chain by chain until you get to the generators and the solar panels, um, which is what we'll do here. So the first thing you need to know is how much power are you using. Um, one easy way is to just go onto your power bowl, and they will tell you that. Um, so here, I don't know. Yeah, I don't have one uh, that looks like this. I grabbed it off the internet, but hopefully this looks familiar to everybody. So this actually just shows you per month what your average kilowatt hours is per day. So you need to multiply that by 1,000. And this graph is really great because it shows you the seasonal variability of what you're actually using. So that's something you definitely need to take account with a solar or any off-grid system because almost all of them vary what they're able to produce throughout the season. So if you use the most in the winter, and you probably also produce the least in the winter, so you'll need the size of your system for that. Um, <clears throat> now, one downside of this is, as we'll talk about a lot more later, you're probably going to want to invest some money into decreasing your power usage as well. Um, so just going from what you're, if you're living in a traditional home, going from what you're using there to an off-grid situation is probably not the best way. And so if money were no object, no problem. Just, just take the biggest number off there and size it for that, and then you're good to go. But this is low cost off grid. So I'm going to talk a lot later about options that you can use um, to decrease what you're spending. So the other way is to do it piecemeal. And that's to actually measure what you're using. And the best thing I found for this is this little kilowatt device, which I, I have one over there. And what that actually allows you to do is plug it in the wall and test directly not only what you're using at the time, but you can leave it in for a couple of days. And it'll tell you how long you've been using it, so how long it's been plugged in and how many kilowatt hours you've used. So it does all the multiplication and everything for you. So you can read it right off of there. And uh, it's good to do that with a bunch of different appliances that you plan to use. And you can find, OK, which, what am I spending the most money on, theoretically, you know, what's using the most power, and what can I do to decrease what I'm actually using. 
You know, I forgot to mention the beginning. If anybody has any questions or wants to bring up something while I'm talking, feel free for that. Yeah. yeah Go I ahead. I assume that's a single plug measure. So it's, it's not plugged into the system and measuring the entire system, right? That's right. Yeah. It's only what's going through that particular plug. Um, yeah. The other option. So if you're, if you're, I'm going to talk a little bit about running a DC system later too. And if you're considering running a DC system or you've got DC appliances, I haven't found anything great for that. This only works on AC. Um, so the best thing to do is actually get some multimeters and just test them that way. There's no real nice way of logging it yet, but I'm, I'm actually working on something for that, um, which we'll get into later. So the idea here is when you go through all of those different things, so let's say you're running a desk lamp or fridge, whatever, I just put some numbers in um, here, you need to write down kind of what your estimate of the time you're using it and how much power it's using. Now, if you measure directly from your device kilowatt hours, you can just put the kilowatt hours in there. But it's good to think about, you know, for instance, in a desk lamp, I use it way more in the winter than I do in the summer because it's brighter in the summer. Or a fridge will run much more in the summer than it will in the winter. Um, and so I like to actually choose the, you know, the darkest part of winter and the lightest part of summer and estimate based on that and get two numbers like here. So estimating here, I'm thinking I'm going to use around 400 watt hours a day in the summer. You know, for this small example, that's a lot less than you probably would in a real house. Or, you know, 436 in the winter. And that's really important to know when sizing your off-grid system. Um, so the next thing you need to do is figure out kind of what peak currents you're looking at pulling in. And there's a number of ways to do that. The, the easy way, if you're in a house, is to just go to your circuit breakers and read the numbers off of them and add them all up. Now, that's going to be way high. You, you're never using near that much. But it's definitely uh, an upper end. And like I said, if there's money's no option, just size your system for that and you're good to go. Um, but the next best way is to actually go item by item and estimate how much current you're drawing from that item, um, either through the kilowatt. So the kilowatt, there's a button that says um, amps. Or if you have a meter, you can measure the amps directly. And I'll show that uh, in a little bit later how to do that. Um, the other thing is if you already measured how many watts it's taking, or it says on the back, all, all, pretty much every device has a, a maximum watt rating. So that's as high it'll, as it'll ever go. Generally, they're lower than that for most devices. But you can use that safe to use as an estimate. So if you know your watts and you know the volt it's running at, so if it's off the wall, it's 120. If it's um, something else, it'll say what it's running off of. And then you can divide that, you know, watts by volts, you get the current. So then what you'll do is run through everything that you have, all the currents that you might be running at the same time, and that'll give you your maximum amp rating. So the big, the big key is if you know for sure I'm never going to run these two things together, then you can keep them separate and have two different totals. Um, but this is more just an upper end, so you can choose the size of everything in your system that you need. So that brings us to an inverter. So that's a larger inverter. Here's a little tiny one back here. And what these do is convert DC to AC. So your, your batteries, a lot of your off-grid you know, solar and a lot of the off-grid generators are going to run DC. And if you plan on plugging traditional stuff into the, the, um, the wall, you're not going to run an entirely DC system, then you will need an inverter. Um, and so the way you size, generally size an inverter is they'll either have an amperage rating, um, which is what we generated last time, so you'll need to use your max amps for that, or they'll have a watt rating. And it's generally, um, it, the, the ratings are a little confusing, so sometimes you'll see them with the input watt rating, but not the output, and then sometimes you'll see the output watt rated. And the, the reason why that matters is these generally only have around 85% efficiency. So what you'll need to do to size it um, is be aware of which one they're doing. And if they don't say, they're probably doing input because it makes the number look bigger. So you'll take the amount of power that you estimated that you would need <coughs> in amps, um, multiply it by 120 so you get the watts, and then divide it by 0.85. And so what that gives you is the amount of watts you're going to need to supply the inverter. And then you'll find one that's bigger than that. You can go as big as you want. It's more obviously more expensive. Um, there's no problem with that. But you, def you don't want to go smaller than your maximum rating. Otherwise, they tend to overheat and destroy themselves. Um, another thing to watch out for when buying these is continuous versus max power. Sometimes they'll give you a max power rating, but isn't continuous. And what that means is you can run it for this, that, at that wattage for a very short period of time. Um, there's times when you might use that, but for most home systems, that isn't common. So you want to make sure that you look for the continuous power rating. Otherwise, uh, you may have bought a smaller inverter than you need or thought you were getting. Um, the other thing is to look for a modified sine wave versus pure sine wave. And what that means is 
if we remember that diagram before of the smooth up and down curve, modified you're going to get a lot of jaggies, which is essentially high frequency noise. And um, those are cheaper, but they can be pretty hard on a lot of equipment. Certain motors don't like them at all. Um, sensitive electronics, it can actually damage them depending on what kind of filtering you have. So um, <clears throat> unless you know for sure that you can do modified, you need to go up to the more expensive pure sine wave inverters. The next thing that people are interested in, of course, is the battery bank. This is probably going to be one of the larger expenses in the system. And it's one that you have a little bit of flexibility with. So, um, <clears throat> it's a little difficult to just give an equation for this because there's so much variability. You know, we might have a dark week here, um, say, where you're producing much less power than normal. And so the question is, how much money do you have? How, much, how essential is it that you have power for the, the whole time? Um, and you can size these independently of, of the panels. So the, the obviously, the more batteries, the longer it lasts. And the way to do that is to, to find your daily usage from the first step of this and multiply that by the days of storage that you're looking for. And I generally recommend at least a couple days, um, unless you have a really consistent power source, like you're running off-grid microhydro, and you know that your stream is good to go, in which case you could maybe size it down to even less than a day. But around here with solar, um, you're probably going to need a couple days or, or more. Um, <clears throat> now, the other thing to look for is you need to multiply it by the battery discharge rate. So on batteries, they actually give a capacity in kilowatt hours frequently, sometimes amp hours, or, um, or just watt hours. But if you're buying a lead acid battery, or uh, depending on the type, they have different well, max allowable discharge rates. So a typical car battery type battery, lead acid battery like that, you cannot discharge it more than 50%, otherwise you're risking extreme damage to the battery. And a lot of general car batteries, actually even more than 30% um, can damage it, which is why you need a deep cycle one. So that needs to be taken into account when you're doing the equations, as well as the efficiency. And generally, it's kind of rough um, because it changes depending on how it's charged. Um, so near the top of a charging cycle, you don't get as much efficiency as you do near the bottom. So as a rough estimate, about 80% efficiency or point, divided by 0.8, and that gives you the capacity that you need for your battery bank. So a little bit, a uh, little bit there. I plan on anybody that signed in, by the way, with your email. A after this, a couple of days, I'm going to put some uh, shorthand together for all this and um, send it out. So if this, if you're a little confused about anything that I said, you'll be able to look at that. And of course, we've got this online. As I, I think some people came late, so they didn't hear that. But we're streaming this online as well as putting a recording of it up, so you can check this out later if you need to go back over anything. Um, so. Before I go on, one suggestion I have is it's kind of nice to have several smaller solar systems. Um, it's not always cheaper, but it's a nice way to get into it, especially if you're trying to transition piece by piece. And it gives you the ability to specify like a, an absolutely essential system and a kind of nice to have one. So if you're running your, your entertainment stuff and maybe some lights that aren't that important, you can run that off one system. And then you, things like your refrigerator or you know, maybe cell phone charging, stuff that you, you feel like you absolutely need to have, that could be off of another one. And that way, you know for sure the one that you absolutely have to have will have plenty of power. And then the one that's nice to have, you can use up you know, as you see fit. So this is one of the things I'm actually most excited about is, is the upcoming battery technology. And so I put some examples here on the top two are lead acid. So there's the sealed lead acid, the cheapest one. Um, or sorry, sealed is the more expensive one. Floating lead acid is the, the cheapest, or flooded lead acid. And then there's lithium batteries, which you see more commonly used in things, um, you know, high-end electronics. It's being used in certain electric vehicles. And then of, on the bottom is uh, nickel iron, which is actually the oldest type on here. This was, some people say it was invented by Edison. It wasn't actually, he stole it from somebody, but he made a factory that produces them. Um, and so they're commonly called Edison batteries. And uh, they haven't been produced, mass produced, uh, by a major company since the 60s. But there's examples of these batteries being used in the railroad industry for decades. And so these batteries have an amazingly long life. And so I did a few of the calculations here to kind of show what the costs look like. So the cheapest is flutolid acid um, just to get into it. But the thing is they have a relatively short life and they take maintenance to, to keep going. So that's what you're paying for. But they're around $240 for a kilowatt hour depending on where you get the source. Now, iron or the iron, sometimes called iron Edison, uh, nickel iron batteries are right now more expensive, 
because there's not many people producing them. But with some of the lifespan that they've shown in history, they, since they last decades, and their, their, um, their maintenance plan, actually, you only even need to touch them once every five to 10 years, depending on how you're doing it, so, uh, according to the manufacturers now. Uh, that's pretty good return on your value. So you're getting roughly you know, less than $10 per kilowatt hour per cycle, 1,000 cycles, which is by far the cheapest, even at their higher price point. And one, uh, so here's an example of some being, there's only one major company that I know of that's producing them, they're ironedison.com, and they only sell in relatively large banks, so you can't just get one of those. It's, um, but they're simple in construction, and they don't take any special materials. The electrolyte inside, so the, the liquid, is not an acid, it's a very mild base. And uh, the plates are just nickel and iron. So these are things that people could get locally. And there's a possibility of people actually doing this yourself. So that's one thing that I'm currently researching at ways to make this extremely low cost by either doing it yourself or maybe um, selling kits to where people can do a lot of the work themselves. Yes? What are the uh, indicators maximum? Is that fluid level? Yes. Um, I for, it's, it's distilled water, and then you need, um, uh, I forget what the exact uh, base is, but it's, act, it's something that you can locally get. Um, I, I'm just blanking on it right now. But yeah, it's, so it's, it's a mild base, essentially, which is good. That's why these last so long, because the reason why the, the uh, lead acid batteries don't last long is every time you discharge it, you're allowing the acid to eat away the lead inside. You're eating away the electrodes. But with these, the, the water doesn't hurt the electrodes, and there's some talk online, I haven't been able to do it myself yet, about how these kind of fail is they actually kind of get crud on them after you know, decades of use. And a good hard scrub on the electrodes might actually return them back to, to normal. And the only maintenance you need to do, so these are um, unsealed, like they are open to the atmosphere. So they lose water very slowly. They actually produce hydrogen, so they do need to be vented, as do um, the flooded lead acid. But uh, the only thing you have to do is occasionally go in on top of the distilled water. Okay, so the next piece of the puzzle, as we're, and second to last actually, as we're working our way back, is the charge controller. So batteries, of course, cannot handle being overcharged. Um, they sometimes need different charge profiles, and so it's not safe to, in the long term, hook up your, your solar panels and your generators directly to the battery. What you need is a charge controller. And on the market right now, there's two primary um, types that you'll see, PWM, pulse width modulation. Those are the cheaper ones. All the more expensive ones are MPPT, which stands for Maximum Power Point Tracking. And uh, they're both good in different situations. So PWM, all it can do is take a higher energy source down to meet the battery. So it can basically disconnect the batteries from the, the panels when they're too full, and it can ramp up and down the power going into them so that they can be charged safely. Usually they have a little bit of safety features in them as well, so if you, you know, connect two leads together, um, instead of getting sparks everywhere, it'll just turn itself off, which is nice. Um, MPPT, on the other hand, they're actually smart. They have a little IC inside, so a controller circuit that measures the power coming out of the panels and will adjust the connection between the two. So they, they actually have a little transformer inside and can operate the voltage on the, the power generation side separately from the voltage on the battery side. And um, the reason why that's important is this graph, you can actually see the, well, this is versus temperature, but there's a hump here, depending on the conditions of how the power is you're pulling out. So if you're drawing too much or too little, you can actually be getting much less efficiency than your panels are rated for. And the, the hump changes depending on how much light there is. It changes on the temperature of the panels and um, a few different things, how they're wired up. And so there's no way to just set that permanently. So what those MPPT charge controllers do, why they're called maximum power point tracking, is they actually will change the parameters and test constantly and find the, the point where you're getting the most power out of your system. Now they are a bit more expensive. And so the, the trade-off here is for small systems where it's you know a couple of panels, you're probably better off just buying another panel than going up to the P MP MPPT charge controller. So PWM, PWM is fine for that. Um, but for anything like a larger tiny house or bigger, or if you're doing like a full house system, you definitely want MPPT. And sometimes you want several. It depends on how you have the system set up. So here's one. And this is something that I'm also looking into again. One option we have for a DIY is actually doing this ourselves. And it, it seems a little out of the reach of the ordinary individual. 
But nowadays, with what's available online, you can actually get um, these items extremely low cost separately, and it doesn't take much skill to actually wire this together yourself. And so, um, here's a this example is is a really interesting one. This was actually posted by TI. It's a Text Instruments, it's a pretty well-known microchip company. And what these designers will do is actually use their chips and give example of, um, of different pieces of electronics. And this is MPPT charge controller. So they did an example charge controller to show other people who are making these, this is how you'd use our chips. But what we have is essentially a free, um, completely open source design by a professional company for a charge controller that anybody can use. And almost every major manufacturer does this. They call them reference designs. Um, and they publish them on their website. They're a little hard to find, but I, I dug this one up. And uh, parts, you can get it for less than half the, the cost, even buying brand new parts um, from a reputable uh, producer in the United States, much less than half the, the cost of an equivalent one of these. This would be a 200 or $300 charge controller, at least, on the market. And I'm, the pricing for parts is pr probably around 100 bucks, depending on how you order them. So. As a community, I'd like to see more of this kind of stuff going up. And I'm actually working on a, a modified design of this, which I'm going to put on my website, opensourcepermaculture.com, to where this is something anybody can make. And it'll be modular. So maybe in the future, people will be making these and selling them for low cost, you know, direct from China or something, to where you have a main controller board. And then as you want to add power, instead of having to throw away or you know, sell your charge controller and get a new one, which is what you have to do now, you'd be able to stick in a few more boards and upgrade your, your power system. Another nice thing about these is the components when you buy them, if you make it yourself, is the component grade is way higher than you'd get pretty much anywhere else. Everybody else scrimps on key things like the capacitors and different um, MOSFETs. And because of that, you can get, with this design, 98% efficiency. OK, so the, the final bit here is power generation. How many solar panels do I need? Usually the first question. Um, and so for this, you need to figure out how much total you need to generate. And so I, I generally do this on a daily. So you, you take your daily power requirement. If you're using an inverter, you need to divide it by the inverter's efficiency. Um, if you're doing it with a battery, you need to, you know, it, depending on how much you, you plan on using a battery, you'll need to divide it by the battery efficiency. Um, and then you need to divide it by the controller's efficiency as well. So if you get a high-end controller, it could be 98%. You basically can almost ignore that. If you get a lower quality one, like a cheap one, uh, MPPT one, those can be as low as 80, depending on how they're being used. And then the next step is to know how much sun you're getting. So this is a map that the US government provides. And uh, there's a link to that website there. They have a lot more in-depth maps, including ones of just specific states. Um, but so this number, kilowatt hours, meters squared per day, it's basically a multiple for the solar panel rating. So say. Uh, that panel is a 30 watt panel. It's pretty common to get 100 watt panels or you know 200 watt panels. They're rated at what the maximum they can produce, um, assuming really bright sun. So what this is telling us is that around here we're getting you know between three and four as a multiple. So if you multiply that by 100, on average per day you're going to get around three to 400 watts for a 100 watt panel. Now of course in the winter it's probably much worse than that, and in the summer it could be better. Um, but that's a decent starting point for getting started. And they do have different months as well available. So if you were really into designing it, you could go into the winter, get a winter month map of this, and estimate it that way, and then get a summer month map. Yeah, so I pretty much already talked about this, but it's best if you calculate in the middle of winter and summer. Um, and another thing you can do is get an inexpensive panel like this and actually measure it, how much it's producing at different times. And uh, I'll try to get the end here so that we can do a quick demo on that, but really, it's it's so different depending on your location. Even you know, from neighborhood to neighborhood, sometimes depending on what kind of particulates are in the air near you and what kind of fog you get, that measurement is always the best thing. Um, so, a quick word about placement: solar panels actually degrade much more quickly if they get hot. Now, they're unfortunately they're black, so that you can't really prevent that. But anything you can do to keep them cool is extremely important for their lifetime, um, and it can make the difference between getting an extra five to ten years out of them or not. Um, and then also they need to be clean, as, as you might expect. And snow loading is one of the worst things. Um, looking at the historical data about how long solar panels last, places that get heavy snow, they last much much um, less time. Yes? So that's counterintuitive. How do you keep a solar panel cool? It's absorbing 
Yeah, good question. Um, the big thing is you don't mount them directly against something else. So if you look at any of the mounting kits you get for a roof or something, they always have an air gap. Um, the other way is like I sh show here, don't put them, if you, can, if you have room, it's much better not to put them on a roof because the roofs tend to get hot by themselves. So if you put them in a place where they get airflow and they have room all around them and space between them, that's basically the best you can get. Some people have looked into doing like water cooling systems. Uh, so far it looks like that's not worth the effort really. Um, but letting them have airflow is 100% essential. Um, the other thing about placing them away from the house is shading. And uh, as I'll talk about later, shading a house is a great way to save energy if you're, if you're cooling in the, in the summer, especially in hot locations. But solar panels are not good with shade. Even a little bit of partial shade on one part of the panel can have a you know, can 20, 30% or more um, decrease in power generation. So anything you can do to get them to where they have full sun as much of the day is, is very important as well as angle. Uh, the, the power they can produce, the maximum power they're rated at, is rated at being pointed directly at the sun. Um, but of course, the sun goes up and down throughout the day. There are tracking systems, but those are a little, probably not worth it. But it is worth it throughout the year to go out every couple months and ch tilt them to be roughly where the sun is at the highest that part of the year. Especially because in the winter you, is when you get the least power. And a lot of times if you go online and you look up what the, the perfect angle is, they do have a chart. But that perfect angle is to get the maximum power throughout the year without moving them, which is fine if you're selling it back to the grid. But if you're not and you need a lot of power in the winter, instead of buying a bunch more panels, you may be able to just tilt them down um, or change it throughout the year. OK, and then so bringing back the parallel and series discussion, how do I know how to power them up? And uh, this, you know, there's a lot of in-depth stuff here. And I'm actually going a lot more into it on the website. Um, I don't really have time here for this. But essentially, you add voltage when you put them in series, but you make them more susceptible to shading power loss. Um, but the, uh, the good thing about adding voltage is you're, de you're not adding amps, and amps is what you need to pay for when you're buying wiring. And wiring is, can be a, a significant cost of the system. Copper, copper cable, especially thick, is not cheap. And because you're doing lower voltages than standard, you're going to need much thicker wire than typical wiring you'll see in the house. So just a quick talk on micro hydro here. It's probably pretty good in this area. You do need uh, water usage rights in Washington, is my understanding, as well as pretty much anywhere on the West Coast. And I'm not, I haven't seen anybody get those. It may be possible. Um, but of course, if you're, if you're uh, comfortable doing something that you know, shouldn't be seen from the general public, then it's still a possibility. Um, it, it's limited by your stream access. So you need to know the flow rate of your stream and the head of your stream, which I'll go into in de detail. And then you can multiply that by that factor, and it gives you the, the maximum possible wattage you can get from that stream. Um, so to measure flow, there's two easy ways. One is just if it's fairly small and you have something like this, you can put a bucket in it. And you're measuring gallons per minute, so you get a five-gallon bucket. Count how many times it's full within a minute with your timer, and then there you go. The other thing is, is called the weir method, where you build, build a little dam, and you have a flat lip over it with some walls. And you, all you need to do is measure the width of that the lip where the water can flow over and the height of the water. And there's a table, and you can look that up, and it tells you what your flow rate is. The other thing you need to measure is head which is also pressure. So the one easy way is if you know your water is you know, this high and you're able to put your generator that high, if you have a way of measuring the change in elevation, you just use that directly in feet. The other thing is if you, you will need to pipe the water down from the source to the pump, um, you can just buy a pressure gauge and you multiply it by 2.31 and that gives you the head based on the pressure. And so with this, here's a chart from a, a, a magnetic alternator, pr pretty common one, and can give you a, an idea of what it can produce based on the head and the flow rate. So if you have 100, say 100 feet of head, which is fairly high, um, and then you know 20 gallons, you can get 240 watts. So you do generally need a lot of water or a lot of um, decrease in, or a lot of pressure, a lot of decrease in head. And then the next thing to consider is turbines. So there's three very common examples, um, Pelton, Turgo, and Francis. And basically, it, they're used in different situations depending on the head. So you know, below 10, you basically have to use a Francis. Um, this is in meters, unfortunately. And then you know, around 100 meters or below, you're using Turgo. And then in like Colorado, you see these a lot, the Pelton ones, which are um, like these ones with the cups. Those you need in pretty high head situations. The other thing to consider is wind turbines. And it's very difficult to estimate these because the wind is so variable. Um, 
But uh, the best way I can think of to do it in the way I've done it is just get a small turbine, a cheap one, and just measure what you get throughout the year. Um, that's the best way to know. And then wiring, you, you need to look at a wiring gauge to tell how thick it is. All right, and then I talked about the modular system. So unfortunately, we're getting, I'm getting pretty short on time, so I do have some ideas about ways to decrease the cost overall. A lot of it has to do with the design of the house. And of course, heating and cooling is one of the most expensive aspects if you're using for electricity. So moving to locally, you know, things you can get off your own property as far as, or, or locally at least cheaply, instead of electricity is pretty much the way to go. Biogas, getting rid of stuff you don't need. Um, yeah, that was a bike powered washer. So there's a lot of really cool stuff out there. And I'm actually working on putting a lot of this stuff online on my website, little projects like this, you know, ideas and bringing it all together. Um, and then of course, we're, it's a DIY world, you know, with eBay and AliExpress, you can get stuff that used to not be available to except for industry people. So you can buy a lot of like the parts for these things that you couldn't get anymore. And they're real cheap because they're direct from China. Um, and then of course, going with a, a DC only system is if you can dump the inverter and go DC only, you save that cost. And there's a lot of really, really high efficiency DC stuff being manufactured for RVs and um, certain mobile like technical systems. And so sometimes it's worth it to buy a better refrigerator instead of buying two more solar panels. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for everyone for coming to the presentation. Um, this concludes the first module of our five module course. I hope you've been taking notes and I hope you notice the secret letter shown on screen during the course of the presentation. You will need to collect five letters throughout the course of this video in order to be eligible to receive your free certificate at the end. So make sure you write those down. Let's move right on to module two, presented by David M. Masters, business guru with decades of experience not only running his own businesses, but coaching people how to build their own businesses as well. So we're going to talk about my, one of my favorite topics, which is like making money. I'd love to do that. And making it off grid is really important because you got to be able to support yourself offline. So how are you going to do that? I'm going to talk to you today about something that's going to be in a course that takes 13 weeks to get through. So if you'll kind of bear with me, uh, there are, there is a, this thing. There are a hundred ways, hundreds of ways to make money offline. So I'm, what I'm going to do is, if you'll bear with me, um, I will give you like the top three things in three different categories. I think we'll have time for that and uh, kind of skip through all the other stuff and make it quick. But you got to work with me here. So <laughs> if we can hold your questions till after, I'll be here for the rest of the day. So we can talk anytime and I can answer your questions then. But if we can hold those until I get through the information, then, um, then that will work for me and us, and I'll be able to have a better chance to get through it. So does everybody agree? Let me see your hands. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good job. All right. So let's get started. So I'm David M. Masters. I'm lead coach, trainer, transfer figuration specialist. I work uh, with St. Paul's Free University. You can find me online at davidmmasters.com. And uh, we're also looking for instructors, so if this resonates with you and you'd like to team up with us, uh, get your uh, message out to the world, uh, we can help you do that, and uh, we like to make the world a better place. And this is the reason that I do what I do. Uh, I have three live kids. Uh, one's a cyber security expert, and one's an actress. She was in a recent film called Echo. I don't know if you saw that at the theaters. Of course I did. And, <laughs> and, and uh, then my youngest is JC, and she is an artist, and she also uh, works with the Girl Scouts of America. So. And, and that's why I do what I do. So first you want to talk about how we're going to do business. So there's, you know, if you call your accountant or if you talk to your lawyer, you're going to get some ideas about how to do business. You're going to go online, you'll see some more ideas, but you are not going to get it all. The people who have it all, have it all. And they're not telling you how to do it. 
You're going to find out some of those ways today. So <coughs> there are the people who have it and the people who don't. So we're going to be learning from the people who do. And if you try to go into business, you probably found yourself going out of business. That happens all the time. Most businesses that start fail. Usually we, we're polite when we say three to five years. It's usually within a year. So, and the businesses that make it are usually like hobbies, right? And they're either supported by, like if, if you're a husband <laughs> and you have a really good job and your wife's in business, your good job is supporting the business. That's normally the way that that works. So we want to get out, we want to break out of that because that's no way to get ahead. And the government's not going to help you. They actually have it set up so that uh, it's hard to succeed. I mean, just around here with the uh, minimum wage going up, how are you going to afford to get the help that you need to run your business nowadays? Really? It's crazy. So, but if you format your business correctly, then you can make, get around all of those loopholes. So the wealthiest people, you'll notice they have like tons of business structures built around. They don't have, they don't put all their eggs in one basket. So if one of their departments or one of their businesses fails, the rest succeed. And they have them, if you, if you set up your business right, you have them compartmentalized so that one doesn't affect the other, or if it does, very little. So, and they have uh, businesses, corporations, foundations, and nonprofit organizations. You're like, what? Nonprofit organizations? Here's a fella we could learn something from. <laughs> this guy has the nerve to run for president and then tells everybody he never paid any taxes, ever. Now, they tried to rebuke him for that, but he said, no, nah, I'm just smart. And you can be that smart, too, if you know how. So we're going to learn some lessons from him and his crew. So you do want to incorporate. There are many different kinds of ways to incorporate. I'm going to tell you one that you probably don't know about, which is the Family Limited Partnership. We never seen that in America until the early 1900s, and it came from England where um, in England, they would send ships out to, do, um, to gather materials to sell. So they'd go out and they would have all of these people on the ship. And then if the ship was uh, overtaken by pirates or lost at sea some other way, they would try to sue the corporation. So they used the family limited partnership so that they would be limited to the uh, losses of the ship and that it wouldn't go back onto the owners. So that's really important if you want to take care of your assets. And this is the guy we have to thank for it. So Weyerhaeuser is a name that we all recognize around here, the Pacific Northwest. And in the 1900s, he was like the number eight uh, employer in the world. So, so he started getting on in age, and they're like, hey, what are we going to do when this guy dies? Because back then, and even today, estate taxes will... <coughs> that, so that is why they came up with the uh, Family Limited Partnership, so that uh, they brought that over from England. For him, he was the first one in America who had it to protect his business so that thousands of people wouldn't be without jobs while he was, uh, had passed away. So. so, and of course, that's successful, and, that, and we know about that today. So there's some advantages of the FLP. You have asset protection, so family members on the FLP assets may not be attached by creditors or divorce courts. If you want to take a picture of this slide with your <laughs> cameras, you can. They have a huge, and also this will be online, uh, huge tax benefits to increase the value of assets uh, within the FLP remains inside the FLP free from taxation. So n what normally happens in estate taxes is if you're, um, the growth 
and the value of your business gets attached to your estate taxes, this instead stays inside the FLP which lives on so that you, so you're not penalized for the growth of, of what you put into your FLP. And the beauty of it is, is you get to say how it is. You can change the conditions of the FLP agreement at any time, including non pro rata distribution. So let's say, just as an example, um, let's say you have um, a daughter who's in your FLP, and she goes out and to a party and has, uh, is on the way home and has an accident. She's a member of the FLP, then the, then the people who were in the accident with her find out you have the FLP, it's worth $18 million or whatever it's worth. And they're like, okay, we're the attorney, attorneys are, this is what they do, this is how they make their living. They're like, oh yeah, we can get everything. We'll get everything from, from the FLP. So they could go to sue, well, they get ev everything from the company. And then when they find out it's the FLP, they're gonna like, Ugh. I'm gonna have to spend a lot of time doing some research here to find out what we can get from the FLP because attorneys don't recognize one at first blush because you don't see very many of them unless you're like in the 1%. And if they don't have any 1% clients, they might not even know. So, so you go in there and you find out that in the lawsuit that the girl, the daughter, has 1% interest in the FLP. See, in, the, uh, in another corporation, it's a, it would be a pro rata thing. So she would have a percentage of the corporation that was equivalent to her participation in the corporation. She might have 30% in a regular corporation. But in this kind of corporation, she has 1%, and that's the limit of her exposure to the corporation. So that's just one of the things. <coughs> Next thing you can do is go for a nonprofit organization. You've probably heard of those, right? <laughs> Maybe even had one. I know I've had a few. <laughs> and so you get tax-free promotion of a good cause. And you can give you special rights and privileges or bargaining chips in dealing with bureaucrats. That should strike a chord with anyone who wants to live off-grid, right? Because you want to do something that normal people can't do. So you want to not be a normal person. So if you had a nonprofit organization that promoted off-grid lifestyle, that's your mission, right? So when you go down and you are negotiating with the city or the county, you can say, hey, you know, I'm the president of this organization. I am trying to, you know, help the organization here. So deal with me, work with me. It gives you a little more clout than it does if you're trying to do it on your own. So nonprofit organization, that could be a cool thing to do. We know someone who has a <coughs> foundation, right? So you can have nonprofit organizations or foundations, charities or trusts. These guys do that. So there's like two different ways that you can go about it. They have a private foundation. So when you do a nonprofit, you can either do it public or private. The two ways to do it. So nonprofit organizations, you can oper they're operated tax-free, they protect your assets, and they give you credibility, which is, can give you power in negotiations. So this is what I was talking about before, public NPO, private NPO. Now, a public NPO, you're required to have a board of directors and must include a majority of members who are not related by blood or marriage. On the other hand, a private NPO, whoever, found, whoever the founder is says who, who plays. The only disadvantage, if there were one, of having a, a private NPO is that if you're counting on getting grants from the government, you, you can't get that you have from, a, from a private. Uh, for, but from a public, you can't, because the public would have to be required to be a 501c3 to get a grant. You could also have a religious organization. I gotta tell you, this one's my favorite. 
because there's that che- separation of church and state thing. I know a lot of people doing really powerful things that are doing this. So it's something you might want to think about. Now, the authorities deal with churches in two different ways. I don't know if you've noticed this, but if you're watching the news, you'll find that in some situations, if there's something going on inside the church that, that could be illegal or if they're after somebody, in some situations, they just run right straight into the church and they tackle whoever it is they're after. And that's one way of doing it. And the other way of doing it is they stand out in the street and they negotiate with the priest. You're like, wait a minute, this is the same thing, right? So, but it's not the same thing because one is a 501c3 and one is not. So if you're going to do a religious organization, you want to think about this. If you do a 501c3, which is a religious nonprofit, then you're entering into a contract with the government. And, uh, and that is, could, could be a problem if you're really looking to maintain the separation of church and state. It actually violates the separation. So, so that is, is something that you want to keep in mind. Uh, 501c3, um, they fall for the charitable contribution scam. That's what I call it. <laughs> because anyone will tell you that I cannot make a donation to your church because you're not a 501c3. That's like weird programming because it's like so not true, but that's what we're all told. That's what the tax uh, accountants tell us because the law says that you can deduct any charitable contribution up to 10% of your income. It doesn't say anything about 501c3, so you can still do that, but they don't tell you that. So you will have to file tax forms if you're a 501c3, and you may pay property tax, and you're subject to being audited at any time because you're filing those uh, tax forms. You still have to do bookkeeping if you're independent, but you don't have a government contract. You don't file tax forms. You don't pay property tax, and you're only audited if you're running unrelated businesses and not reporting the income. And your church can be about anything. This is like a really weird example. (laughs) This is the church of the subgenius right here. (laughs) Tired of trying to justify your sins? Let Bob justify them for you. (laughs) Really? But this is a long-standing church, and they've passed all of the tests of time, and, and they're... It's for real. You can look it up online. You can join if you want. <laughs> You'd be surprised. They have some, they have some great things like 24-hour marriage certificates. <laughs> you, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing. But it shows you that uh, you could create a religious organization and have anything as your basis. It could be, you know, if, you're, if you have hydropower, you could just, you know, have... Church of the Reigning Heavens. <laughs> Dot com. Somebody buy that. <laughs> 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 the, this is why you want to have, uh, be careful about the way that you do business because you want to cover your assets. And you want to do it in a way where you can have some freedom. So, but you want to be careful that when you're being free, that you're not breaking the law. No matter how you do it, there's not going to be a really good way to prevent you from going behind bars, and we don't want anybody to do that. So, but, you, but if you're smart, you can do all the things that you want to do, that you love to do, without fear of prosecution, if you do it right. Ah, cash flow. <laughs> I love cash flow. Okay, and that's what you're going to need to feed your family, right? I mean, you can, if you're living off grid and you're on on a farm, you can trade squash or you can, uh, and farm fresh eggs. That'll get you so far, but that's not going to pay your mortgage payment. It's it's not going to get you out of working for the man. So we want to try to get you off, out of that system and into a different system. So as the author of the home-based businesses and emergency cash flow. I could talk about this subject for days, hours, months. (laughs) I love it, I love it. So so we're first gonna take a look at online. 
Now, re there's two ways to do business, online and offline. And so the reason I say online is because it's really cool, but some off-grid people don't want anything to do with, with online. So, and if that's true, just bear with me through this part, and then we'll, we'll catch you up in the next part. Okay, affiliate marketing is like a really cool thing that you can do online to make some money. So I don't know if you've noticed that uh, affiliate marketing is such a cool thing, but what it is is there, there are businesses that will pay you for referring their products to people that you know, and then when they buy a product, you receive a commission on that product. So, and the three biggest ones, we'll talk about them, the three biggest ones are Amazon, eBay, and ClickBank. Now, you probably didn't even know about eBay. You, you probably heard about Amazon because they're the biggest, right? But eBay, you probably didn't know about. And ClickBank, I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. So, uh, Amazon, their referral program is uh, pays like 4%, I think, and they have different price levels for different kinds of items. So you share them to your people, and if people buy them, like I hope that Daniel does that <laughs> for his off-grid permaculture, like this system right here, you could go on his site and he would say, buy this, you buy this from Amazon, let's say that kit costs $71, and it doesn't matter whether you buy it through his link or anyone else's link, but he's going to get 4% because you bought it through his link, and that's how he supports his ministry or, or organization. So that's, it's a beautiful thing. So you don't pay any more, but he gets a kickback, and any, anyone in this room can do that. There's a, if you go to Amazon, you go to the bottom of the page. It says Amazon Affiliates. You click on that, fill out a form, They'll give you a link, a custom link for anything you can find on their website. And then you can share that with your people. They even have a generic link that just goes to their website. If you say, you know, support our organization by buying through Amazon through this link. No matter what they buy, you're going to get a piece of the action. Do I do that? I do that. Have I been paid for diapers? Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> anything they, like if they click on a link, anything else they put in their cart, you get paid on that, so that's pretty cool. So then eBay, eBay is kind of freaky because you can sell anything on eBay and now you can sell other people's stuff on eBay and get a piece of the action. So they have affiliate links also. So you want to go to that site, check that out. Now, ClickBank, this is a little different deal. I mean, they're huge, they're number three. But they sell only digital products. Most of them are information products, classes, courses, all kinds of crazy stuff like that. If you are, if you set up your nonprofit and you are, uh, you have a target market for people, you can go on there and find online information that you can refer to your people. Now they don't pay you no four percent; they're paying you know, like seventy-five <laughs> percent. That's crazy. You know, you sell a hundred dollar course, you just made 75 bucks. Whole different ball game. Because they don't have to ship anything. Everything's done online. So that's, that is something to look into. Next thing we want to talk about. Fulfillment by Amazon. This is so cool. <laughs> I, I just talked to somebody on uh, Wednesday. Wednesday, who said, we just sold 98 items this week through Amazon FBA. So FBA is you either create or buy a product wholesale and you ship it to the Amazon warehouse and they put it on their website and then they do everything. They send the product out to the customer, they handle all of the customer relations. You have to do nothing. They just send you a check when stuff sells. Not bad, right? And so that was, I didn't plan that on Wednesday hearing that, to be able to share that with you. But another client on Thursday <laughs> says this. Oh, this is a great story. <laughs> says, wow, this is really great. I bought this generator from Amazon. Oh, no, no, from eBay. Bought it, and it came... Uh, 
this is actually, I got ahead of myself. Stop that. I'm going to share that story in a minute. <laughs> That's a different a Amazon program I'm going to tell you about. But fulfillment by Amazon, you can do it with any product. Um, I have some books that are in that program, and I have another uh, about 200 other items in there that uh, I do fulfillment by Amazon. So, uh, save questions for after. <laughs> Keep that though. Write it down. Write it down, and we'll we'll do questions later because I've got a lot of stuff to get through. Okay, so this was the one <laughs> I wanted to save the next story for. Is that there's a thing called uh, Amazon to eBay arbitrage. This is going to blow your mind. So get ready. So make sure your feet are firmly on the <laughs> planted on the ground. This is going to freak you out a little bit. You're going to need three things to make this happen. You're going to need an Amazon account, a PayPal account, and an eBay account. <coughs> so what you do is that you find something. You have a, by the way, you're going to need an uh, Amazon Prime account to do this best. So it's, I don't know what they charge for Prime now. It's like 20 bucks a month or something like that but you get the free shipping op uh, uh, option. So what you do is you find what you'd like to sell on eBay on Amazon. So you find it for, so you find it, oh, I can get this book by David M. Masters <laughs> on Amazon.com with Prime, free shipping, for 10 bucks. And I can send it, sell it on eBay for 20 with free shipping. So when that book sells, then you order the book after you got your money. You order the book on Amazon, and then you have it shipped to the person who bought it from eBay with a gift receipt. You have to make sure to get a gift receipt because then the receipt comes to you, and the product goes to your client. Now, this is the story I almost told you before. <laughs> So this is the Thursday, the Thursday story. The Thursday story was this. I bought this generator. I bought it on eBay for X amount of stuff. But the fan didn't work on it. So I'm returning it. So I call them up to return it, and I'll be a son of a gun. Their customer service is handled by Amazon. I didn't know they did that. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you better tune in to the stream this weekend. So <laughs> So what happened was they bought it on eBay from someone. It was fulfilled by Amazon, w shipped with a gift receipt. They went to return it. it and, of course, there's Amazon sends them a free shipping thing that goes on the box. And the post office comes, picks it up, and away it goes. And they get a replacement. And the seller didn't have to do anything except for spend two minutes punching that their address in. And he made some money. I don't know how much money he made, but here's some examples. I play a little guitar. So I buy guitar strings <laughs> every once in a while. So here's on eBay. This is an eBay listing. It's listed for $19.46. Now that person is getting it fulfilled by Amazon pays $9.99. You made $9.47 for two minutes typing in someone's address, gift receipt. Here's an end table looking thing. On eBay, $38.25. Oh, look at it. Prime, $15.72. You just made $22.53. You did nothing. Well, you type in a form. Ah, I like to look pretty. <laughs> so I'm going to need some nice makeup brushes so I can get this whole set for 40 bucks. And by the way, this is just, this is like last night. So this is like really, really current. This is not like in the can somewhere. These are all real right now. Nine dollars and ninety-nine cents. <laughs> That's a good return on your money when you didn't even spend any, <laughs> and you made thirty bucks. And then there, here's a 
Camera lens, $139.99. Fulfilled by Amazon for $88.99. You made $51 on that one. And it is like size doesn't matter. How about a bunk bed? <laughs> I, really? $326.32? Like right now today, you could get that. $180.99 free delivery on Prime. Not bad. <laughs> well, that's the thing. That's what you, you're a bargain shopper. There are so many people like the, my clients on Thursday, right? They don't care. They just want it now. They have a PayPal account. They have eBay. They go in there like, bam, I need this generator. There it is. They aren't going to spend four hours like you will. Shopping around all the different places looking for the best deal. I'm sorry I answered a question. <laughs> so it's all about these guys. And you want to make sure that you have them in your pocket. If you do this program, make sure this is in your pocket before you ship it. Because there are some like evil scammers out there who buy credit cards and, uh, and, and checks off the dark web and use them to buy stuff. So make sure that you've confirmed with your bank that you have the funds before you ship. That's an important piece of this piece because you don't want to get ripped off. Okay, ah, now we can go offline. <laughs> that was online, so those three things. Uh, now to go offline, this is uh, going to be some really important stuff. You want to, I'm all about helping people achieve their highest and best. This has like been my ministry since... 19, long time ago. <laughs> so um, that is what I do, and so I help people do this stuff all the time. I help them monetize their skills, abilities, and their purpose. And this is like, it doesn't, it doesn't really occur to you uh, unless you've run into someone like me, but uh, all of the, I mean, you were, you were actually, when you came to this planet, you were like, you came here with the ability to make bank. And society has told you, said, that's not how it works. This is, they have a different program. They want you to do, you've you got to work really hard. You have to be from a good family. If you're not a good family, they still might be able to get in through the side door. You got to go to school. You got to get training. You have to be qualified. You have to have a piece of paper from the government that says you can do this thing, and then you can get a good job. Well, there, there are other ways to get this done. So you want to monetize your skills, your abilities, and your purpose. Now, skills are those things that once you do all of this and you start, I mean, uh, just to warn you, like this is like life right now. If you're not, if you are working for the man, this is the life you live in. And it's not very satisfying. But if you start working for yourself and you start monetizing your gifts, your abilities, your talents, you know, the things that God brought you here for. I'm sorry I said the G word. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, now you're making money doing the stuff that resonates with you. Like your life changes. That, that You no longer live that life. And you can't, from where you're at, if you're stuck working for the man right now, you might not be able to even imagine this at the time. But once you make that transition, oh my God, everything changes. Because you don't spend one minute doing what you don't want to do anymore. And you can pretty much decide how much money you make. That's a different discussion. But at least you, don't, you can make as much as you're making on your job. So skills are those things that you've learned to do. Like you went to school for them. Uh, you trained with them. You learned those from other people. And then you have special abilities. Which those are those things that just come natural to you. Like my daughter who studied to be an artist, a multimedia artist, she was born with that ability. I mean, she was four years old drawing pictures. I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. I'm like, I can draw a box. <laughs> That's about it. Put a check mark in it. And so those things, you can, uh, people will pay you to share you that information, those things that come easily to you. The things that you do are like, time just passes and you don't even know. It's like, I was just sitting there for 15 minutes, but actually, you know, it's like three hours. 
It's crazy. And I know people that actually, I don't know if this is a good thing or not, but they get on the internet and they love the internet. They could spend all day on the internet. This is what they love. They don't love anything else, but they love that. And like one person I know makes really good money now as a private investigator (laughs) using primarily the internet, using all of her time on there. So she found a way to monetize that thing that she loves. Now your purpose is the reason that you came here. So, and you just bear with me while I share this with you because it might be outside your wheelhouse right now. But you have lived your life and sometimes it's pretty lackluster. Sometimes it's not even fun. And every one of those things that you went through is worth continuous trips to the bank. If you realize that was part of your purpose. And this is a huge part of what we do at St. Paul's Free University is we help peop- empower people with the things that would seem like really tragic, horrible things that people have gone through. And we teach them to turn them into cash. And not only do we do that, but we make them feel like that their life now has purpose. Before that, they were a victim. And now after that, you know, they're helping other people. And they've, they've overcome all of that. So it's just, it's crazy. Sorry, I didn't mean to get all wigged out there. And you say, oh, I'm not qualified. That's the first thing everybody says. This is a great quote by Richard Bach. We teach best what we most need to learn. Now that sounds like, oh yeah, that's a good saying. But I can tell you what, I've taken a lot of college classes. I've taken business classes from math teachers. Now, the math teacher is not passionate about that business class. I've also taken business classes from people who've lost millions of dollars in corporations. Who do you think was more passionate about that subject? I learned far more from the people who lost that money because they're like way smarter and they know how to ask questions none of us even need to think about in those courses. So, so your value to someone, if you've been through some horrible experiences, incredible compared to what it uh, would be for other people who had just learned it in a classroom. You know, they're qualified to teach those classes at college. But are they any better? Probably not. You're probably the expert. So we want you to share your message and shout it from the the the, uh, rooftops. So live a better life, your best life, and make the world a better place by some guy I know pretty good, <laughs> David M. Masters. Uh, that's actually a, the title of a book you can get on Amazon. Sell <laughs> 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 it on eBay. <laughs> that's good. But this is like my motto, and it's the motto of every, pretty much everybody that I come in contact with. You know, it's just, we want to do that. We want to live a better life, and that's why we do all of these things. And, and take you to a place where you're living your best life and make the world a better place. And you can do that off grid. You can do it, on, you can do it any, under any circumstances. So uh, th- that is what he is here. And that's my life mission. And here at St. Paul's Free University, we want to do that. And we have all of us that we'll be sharing with you today uh, can, would love to invite you to come into our family if you would feel the call to do that. And, and empower you to make some, some uh, really good money doing what you love, what's meaningful to you. That's, that's what we do. So if you'd like to do that, um, contact me at davidmmasters.com. And now I can answer any questions you might have. How about that? We made it. I love it. <laughs> Woo-hoo. Okay. Questions? Questions. Did I answer your question? Yes. By, a- by accident. No other questions? Yes. You actually don't purchase anything. So what you do is you find something on Amazon. This is a good question. Uh, do I have to purchase on Amazon before I list on eBay? How does that work? No, you just find 
there are many ways to set up this like a business. Let's say, like for Daniel, for instance, let's say he was going to do that. He already has people who are interested in this uh, energy information here, right? So off-grid energy. So he could list those items on his website for, for X amount, with have them buy it through eBay. Now, if he lists on Amazon, he gets 4%. But if he lists the same kit on eBay from his website and they click through to that, buy it through, through there, and he fulfills it, he made 200 bucks instead of, you know, whatever the 4% is, 40 bucks. So you don't buy it. All you do is find stuff that you like and then you, on Amazon, and then you list it. In every one of those examples I showed you, except for one, they posted the same picture that they had on Amazon, which I would suggest that you not do. Usually you should have a different kind of a picture. If you like, like the camera lens was the only one, it was just sitting on a table. But if the camera lens was like on a camera with someone holding it, it would have been way better than someone that more likely to buy that, but, but um, sooner. So yeah, you don't have to buy anything. So you, you just find it, the listing, create a listing on eBay, and then when someone buys it, then uh, you have to place the order with a gift receipt, and it gets shipped to them, and you don't have to do anything else. Yes? So the religious organization entity. Yes. But independent version, what is that? Is that, what is that consistent? The independent religious organization? Let, let me get a little more information. What do you mean, independent? Because they are. It's so easy to create. So <laughs> you just make it up. Amen. <laughs> yes, you actually, there are ways. Uh, I'm going to direct you to Google on that one because there's about, I mean, we teach like a whole day class on that. So there's hundreds of ways to create it. But, uh, of course, it's really easy. You can do it online. You can do a religious 501c3. But uh, it depends what you want to do with that. If you want to be, if you want to get government grants, then you have to do it that way. But if you really want to be private and independent, then there are many other ways that you can do that. So I'll refer you to Google or, or maybe I'll see you in the class. <laughs> That's a Anyone else? And it's, uh, it, the price varies anywhere from free to thousands of dollars, so. I, interestingly enough, um, I was, I had, I've been a minister for, I was in, I was in the God business for about 10 years. So, <laughs> so in, in Oregon and in Washington, and I started in Oregon, and when I came to Washington, like, in Oregon, they have, like, a registration process. And when I came to, uh, Washington, I went into the courthouse to register, and they're like, dude, you're in Washington. And I'm like, what? They said, they said, yeah. I'm like, no, I got to, like, fill out forms and register and file, and they're like, no. And they said, if you're a minister in the state of Washington, all you have to do is say you're a minister. We have no paperwork here. I was like, what? Can I still marry people? They're like, yeah. I'm like, Okay. There you got first-hand information. That happened to me in real life right here. <laughs> Some states, you know, Washington's one of them, really liberal when it comes to religious organizations. They're like, religious organizations? We don't even want to play that. <laughs> Unless you're a 501c3, then it's not really Washington C. That's the feds. That concludes our second module of this five-module course. Now may be a good time to take a break because otherwise we're going to go right into the third module and this one's a real doozy. This module will be presented by guest speaker Wendy Lynn Johnson, a child care specialist and mother who has decades of experience not only raising her own children, but raising a whole community of children. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm excited that you're here today to talk off-grid. Um, well, these two young men are kind of a hard act to follow, but I will do the best that I can. 
Um, my name is Wendy Johnson. I am a certified life coach. I was a child care provider for 22 years. Um, I have a big family. I have five children. I have three grown sons, and I have two stepdaughters. Um, I also have a granddaughter. That's pretty amazing. So what else was I going to tell you about myself? I think that was about it. So let's get to raising a family sustainably. So creating a sustainable lifestyle takes a lifelong commitment to learning and experimenting, exploring and committing to increasingly sustain sustainable practices. Above all, loving. Because beyond all the frightening news and beyond all the frustrating politics, beyond the failed international agreements, there really is just one question. How do you want to live your life? You want to live it with fear or you want to live it with love? Fear feels defeated, feels helpless, feels frustrating. The love route feels so grounded and purposeful and hopeful. When moving into a sustainable lifestyle, it may involve, m involve making radical changes, shifts, in how we spend our days, our every day. Integrating these changes into our lives involves first shifting toward wanting to make the change. Our attitude is the energy force behind it all. As long as you derive inner help and comfort from anything, you should keep it. If you were to want to give it up in a mood of self-sacrifice or out of a stern sense of duty, you would continue to want it back. And that unsatisfied want would make trouble for you. Only give up the thing when you want some other conditions so much that the thing no longer has any attraction for you or when it seems to interfere with that which is more greatly desired. And that's a quote from Gandhi. So effective ways to shift mindset could be th reading some sustainable blogs and books and watching videos, maybe taking some classes on sustainability. Join some local sustainable communities. Effective ways to shift mindset, making a smaller shift leads to a larger shift as the benefit to each shift becomes clear. So it quickly becomes clear that choosing a life of love requires us to change just about every aspect of our life. To change how we spend our days involves shifting our lifestyle away from consumption and towards a more sustainable activities such as self-reliance. Becoming more self-reliant might look like learning how to repair things, sewing, growing food, or taking skill building classes. Collaborating with others. There's many ways of doing that. We can barter our services. We can take sewing classes, gardening classes, growing food, carpooling, ride sharing. We can learn how to cook with local sustainable produce or even where to shop for it. Um, we can buy used equipment, used clothing and furniture and appliances and tools. And some of those places that you could buy those things might be eBay, Craigslist. You might try garage sales, free cycle programs, hand-me-downs, neighbors and friends many ways of collaborating that. You may want to choose to join a sustainability community. So there's local green meetup groups. There's the Sierra Club US, US sustainability organizations, pioneers programs, volunteerwatch.org, Friends of the Earth International. Children. Shifting entertainment to love to low impact activities, such as spending time in nature. Maybe reading or downloaded 
reading downloaded books or library books, volunteering on local sustainability projects. So if you're raising your family in a sustainable environment, there will likely be more chores for everyone in the house. You may have a vegetable garden or an herb garden or a flower garden or all of them. And these gardens are going to take some tending to. You may also have animals such as cows or chickens, goats, even pigs. The cows will need milked and the chickens' eggs will need to be collected. So you also might be homeschooling your children as well as meals to prep for. As a parent, it can be difficult to incorporate all the fun activities with all the responsibility that comes along with all of these chores, with all that responsibility that comes with a family. Structure can cut down on all the stress of life by helping us to more easily maintain more positive habits. This is important because whether we realize it or not, habits are what drive many of the activities in our lives. For example, if you get in the habit of checking your social media first thing every morning, you might get sucked into a time warp and lose an hour of your day spent on activity that will relatively be forgotten. This is what I call a time suck. <laughs> If you were to get involved in, the hab in habits or develop habits or routines of working out or exercising first thing in the morning, maybe try journaling or meditation or listening to positive affirmations. That's one of my favorites. These things will bring great benefit to your life rather than just losing all that time. Having a routine can ensure all the tasks at hand are completed. Children thrive on routine, knowing what is next and what is expected of them. I owned a licensed family home childcare for over 22 years, and without a daily routine or a schedule, we'd have had total chaos. All the kids knew exactly what to expect. Um, they knew what was coming next. For example, once they were done cleaning up from their morning of free time, they would get a mat from the closet and they would place it in the same place every single day. They would go to their cubbies then and they would get a blanket and they would place it on the blanket. They would then go and do their wash up and start pre prepping themselves to have lunch. This allowed me time to be able to prepare their meals and get other things done because they already had their routine and they didn't need as much direction from me. So children thrive with routine. While living a sustainable life and having many tasks, a good routine reduces our need for time to plan every day. What can we incorporate in a daily routine to live a more sustainable lifestyle? Environmental sustainability. Let's talk a little bit about environmental sustainability and how we can help as a family unit. Well, environmental sustainability doesn't mean living without luxuries, rather being aware of your resources and reducing unnecessary waste and consumption. Energy conservation is itself a source of energy. Simple ways to reduce your household energy use would be to routinely turn off your lights, teaching our children to routinely turn off their lights, teaching them to routinely unplug appliances. Even lights that are plugged in to the wall are using energy even if they're switched off. Routinely recycle. Routinely compost waste. Make sure your roof is well insu insulated. Routinely close doors and windows while using heat or air conditioning. One simple and relatively cheap way that we can all start to make a difference is by switching our electricity to green power. This means using power generated from clean renewable sources such as the sun and the wind and waste power rather than coal. So at this 
point I would like to share with you, I click it twice, a video, a child's perspective. Hello, I'm Severin Suzuki speaking for ECHO, the environmental children's organization. We're a group of 12 and 13 year olds trying to make a difference. Vanessa Setti, Morgan Geisler, Michelle Quigg, and me. We've raised all the money to come here ourselves, to come 5,000 miles to tell you adults you must change your ways. Coming up here today, I have no hidden agenda. I am fighting for my future. Losing my future is not like losing an election or a few points on the stock market. I am here to speak for all generations to come. I am here to speak on behalf of the starving children around the world whose cries go unheard. I am here to speak for the countless animals dying across this planet because they have nowhere left to go. I am afraid to go out in the sun now because of the holes in our ozone. I am afraid to breathe the air because I don't know what chemicals are in it. I used to go fishing in Vancouver, my home, with my dad until just a few years ago we found the fish full of cancers. And now we hear of animals and plants going extinct every day vanishing forever. In my life, I have dreamt of seeing the great herds of wild animals, jungles and rainforests full of birds and butterflies. But now I wonder if they will even exist for my children to see. Did you have to worry of these things when you were my age? All this is happening before our eyes and yet we act as if we have all the time we want and all the solutions. I'm only a child and I don't have all the solutions. But I want you to realize, neither do you. You don't know how to fix the holes in our ozone layer. You don't know how to bring the salmon back up a dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. And you can't bring back the forest that once grew where there is now a desert. If you don't know how to fix it, please stop breaking it. Here, you may be delegates of your government, business people, organizers, reporters, or politicians, but really, your mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, aunts and uncles, and all of you are someone's child. I'm only a child, yet I know we are all part of a family, five billion strong, in fact, 30 million species strong and borders and governments will never change that. I'm only a child, yet I know we are all in this together and should act as one single world towards one single goal. In my anger, I am not blind, and in my fear, I am not afraid of telling the world how I feel. In my country, we make so much waste. We buy and throw away, buy and throw away, and yet northern countries will not share with the needy. Even when we have more than enough, we are afraid to share. We are afraid to let go of some of our wealth. In Canada, we live the privileged life with plenty of food, water, and shelter. We have watches, bicycles, computers, and television sets. The list could go on for two days. Two days ago here in Brazil, we were shocked when we spent time with some children living on the streets. This is what one child told us. I wish I was rich. And if I were, I would give all the street children food, clothes, medicines, shelter, and love and affection. If a child on the streets who has nothing is willing to share, why are we who have everything still so greedy? I can't stop thinking that these are children my own age, that it makes a tremendous difference where you are born, that I could be one of those children living in the favelas of Rio. I could be a child starving in Somalia, or a victim of war in the Middle East, or a beggar in India. I am only a child, yet I know if 
all the money spent on war was spent on finding environmental answers, ending poverty, and finding treaties. What a wonderful place this earth would be. At school, even in kindergarten, you teach us how to behave in the world. You teach us to not to fight with others, to work things out, to respect others, to clean up our mess, not to hurt other creatures, to share, not be greedy. Then why do you go out and do the things you tell us not to do? Do not forget why you are attending these conferences, who you're doing this for. We are your own children. You are deciding what kind of a world we are growing up in. Parents should be able to comfort their children by saying, everything's going to be all right. It's not the end of the world, and we're doing the best we can. But I don't think you can say that to us anymore. Are we even on your list of priorities? My dad always says, you are what you do, not what you say. Well, what you do makes me cry at night. You grown-ups say you love us, but I challenge you, please, make your actions reflect your words. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> it was it was older, huh? It's 1992. Okay, so now we're going to talk about kids and energy. If I can find my slides, no, it's starting it over. There we go. So, as a kid, the concept of consumption and money is completely foreign. Things are just there for you to use, be it the food that you eat or the toys that you have to play with. Electricity that powers the nightlight in your room. That's usually why we're met with blank faces when you tell children to turn off lights when they leave a room or stop opening and closing the refrigerator just to see if the light goes on and off. So how do you convince a child to be more conscientious of the day-to-day -day household energy consumption when they think that the picture on the television set is just a result of magic. We need to educate our children on the energy they use and empower them to make smart energy decisions. It can be fun. It can be a money-saving activity. Here are a few ways we can empower our children and reduce energy consumption. First off, if we personalize their energy usage with relatable examples, throwing out terms like kilowatts, carbon footprint, and the energy grid probably won't relate to your grade school kids. So using relatable scenarios and allowing them to connect the dots between their behavior and the energy use can help educate them on their personal impact. For example, a video game console consumes uh, up to 11 billion kilowatt hours per year. That is roughly $1 billion in annual electricity bills. That is as much as all the households in Houston, Texas, the fourth largest city in the US. A lot of this electricity is wasted when the consoles are left in standby mode. So teaching our children to power off their consoles when they're done playing can lower the usage of energy and begin their understanding of how little actions can add up to make a big difference. So just as the schools help educate our children on the three R's, we need, to help, we need their help teaching them an additional R, reducing energy consumption. So numerous utilities have community engagement platforms that reward individuals and schools for consuming energy-saving behavior. 
One of these schools is Queen of Heaven Catholic School in Canada. Milton's Hydro program, they leverage Milton's Hydro's program to educate its students to become eco-warriors and raise energy awareness through the school with announcements and posters. In most families, our number one priority is our children and their education and community. Many parents, grandparents, involved in the sustainable community think about family bonding activities and opportunities. How can we connect with our kids while living according to our earth-friendly values, like teaching low consumerism, care of the earth, healthy habits, as well as safety first. While it is important to instill eco-consciousness in our children, it's even more important to wholeheartedly support our children's interest, facilitating for them, getting involved in their lives. Nothing is more sustainable than a strong family connection. Having fun with one another and making choices together that make the whole family feel good. And when this happens, instilling values comes naturally. Your kids are more likely to listen to you and share these values. If, you're sp if you've been spending ample time listening, the key word here is listening to your children and what most matters to them. At times, we may feel disconnected from each other or stuck in a rut. Maybe your family bonding activities don't feel so bonding. Maybe they're too expensive or they put too much focus on stuff versus connection. So let's talk about things you could do with your children that could help you bond while living a sustainable lifestyle. How about making some soap? We all like to be clean and smell good. Our teens even like to smell good. Showing them how to make soap that they create can help open conversations that might otherwise be awkward. As your child of any age, or ask your child of any age questions about why we need soap. Yes, even ask your teenagers. You might be wet, met with, what? Of course, it's to be clean. But you can take this as an opportunity to talk to them about how our peers can judge us based off of our smell. You could talk about how different body chemistry reacts to different scents. So something that smells amazing on me may not be so appealing on you. I have an example. I um, went shopping one time with my girlfriends. And this in particular girlfriend had this perfume that I always just loved. And so we're in Macy's one day, and she's like, oh, yeah, this is the one that I wear. So, you know, the, we're all standing around the counter, and I spray this stuff all over us, and then... I leave and we all get in the car and we're driving down the road and I get met with, oh my God, who put on the old lady perfume? That was me. It did not mix with my body chemistry. So encourage your kids to experiment with different scents. There are many masculine fragrant, fragrant essential oils that make great soap scents as well as more feminine ones. It also helps your child to learn how to make decisions and develop a sense of what they like and the idea that it matters. They develop a sense of self. Our children learn from all of our interactions with them. One of the most amazing parts about family bonding activities are all the fun conversations that you can create. Let's explore a few more activities. Um, this is one of my favorites. You can read a book together and then watch the movie. And then you can discuss the differences between the movie and the book, because as we know, they're never the same. You might try playing 20 questions while we weeding the garden. And that might look like asking fun, thought-provoking questions, such as, do plants feel pain? Would you feel like you had more room to expand your roots as well as your foliage? Do you know what foliage is? Are some examples. You could play a game 
of storytelling round robin. That might look like, once upon a time there was a little ladybug. She was the keeper of a big, beautiful vegetable garden. Her duties were to encourage each person to expand on the story. Make it fun. You can play this with any age group. The key is to just make it about something that they're interested in. It helps open up their feelings so that they are more likely to communicate. And that is when the bonding happens. You could make natural bird feeders out of nut butter seeds and pine cones. You can try roasting a marshmallow over a beeswax candle. You might even try and make the candles first. Here's my ultimate favorite. I just did this recently with a group of kids. Take blankets, lay them out in the yard. Look up at the stars at all the constellations. Count how many shooting stars you see. I just recently learned that there is a phone app, if you're interested, that will actually link up in the moment to where the constellations are. So some of your teens that have phones that, you know, we don't want to put away our electronics during family bonding time, there's a good way to use it to your advantage. Whoops. Sometimes things come up. However, if your intention is to bond, you might choose to let the issues go at the time and revisit it at a later date. Because if we take issue during family bonding time in a negative way, it will close our children off to wanting to participate in the future. Make a lifelong commitment to making the most loving choice each and every time. It involves redefining how we want to live our lives. This step is the first and most difficult, but through its practice, we gain a real sense of purpose. Thank you. That's all I get. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Wendy. That That concludes the third module of this five module series of presentations. By now, you should have collected three of the five secret letters which will entitle you to your free printed certificate sent to your door at the end of this presentation. If you don't have three letters, make sure you go back and find those before you move on. This fourth module is taught by love and relationship guru Mark Seidler, who travels around the country with his partner Lynetta in a solar-powered RV. In this presentation, he's going to share some of the financial considerations of building and living in an off-grid RV, as well as what it takes to build a strong, intimate connection with your partner when you are living off the grid. Hey everybody and welcome. I'm really glad you're all here. And this is really exciting for Lynetta and me. Um, that's us there. This I we've kind of been living the dream life. Um, one of the reasons that w we've lived in an RV full time for four years now. We've been together five years. And uh, four years ago we got married. We were living in a uh, house in the Redwood Forest near Santa Cruz. Beautiful, beautiful place. But both of us had a goal of being out in the world and helping people heal their lives, particularly people who've had trauma in their past like we have, and create amazing relationships like we have. And we really wanted to be out in the world. And Lynetta said, you know, we really can't be, we had a little home office set up in, the, in a big closet we had. And uh, we were living on Lost Valley. And Lynetta said, you know what, we can't really live on a lost road and be out in the world. Like, we need to get out in the world. So really, Lynetta had this lifelong dream of always wanting to travel on the road. She had an aunt who did that. And for me, I, I hadn't really thought about it other than I took a trip with my parents when I was a uh, teenager. And it was actually the most memorable family trip. Me and my two sisters, like, still remember it to this day as like the best family experience we had. We did a two-week trip where we traveled from uh, Los Angeles 
did a big loop through the national parks and then up into Canada and then came down the West Coast and absolutely loved it. So um, this summer, in fact, we did a reenactment of this trip. Lynetta had not been to most of the national parks. So uh, we were in the winter down in LA where we have a lot of family. And then we, we went up through 11 national parks all the way through the West up almost to the Canada border. And then we came across and then down to here. And it's been a phenomenal life. So many times we meet people say, wow, you're living my dream life. And I want you to understand, we are not retired. In fact, this, this, this is new careers we're working on. I still have an old career. I've been a uh, computer consultant for about 30 years. And I still support people remotely, as David explained. You know, w being able to support yourself is really crucial to your lifestyle. And that's one of the things we do to support ourselves. And then we also train people in, uh, we have a Soul Wizards program where we train people how to create what you want in life, how to, how to get rid of what you don't want in life and how to bring in what you do want in life. That's really our passion. And as a, uh, and a second thing is to help couples, either people in relationship who just know in your heart of hearts it's not everything you know it can be, or you want that relationship and you don't know how to get there. Like you've been in some relationships, maybe you're divorced a time or two, and you know, it's just like you want it and it's been a struggle and you don't know what do I need to change so I can really have that ultimate relationship. And we have that ultimate relationship and it wasn't without a lot of struggle. Between the two of us, we have four, count it, four <laughs> previous divorces, previous marriages. And we've really worked over our whole lifetimes to get to this point, you know, and we don't want other people to have to wait till their, Lynette is in her mid-50s, I just turned 61. We don't want you all or your friends to have to wait till this age to figure it all out. It's like, you know, the techniques, the tools to get what you want now in relationship, they're all here. And so we're really passionate about teaching people how to have that in relationship as well. So four years ago, we started on this path and we got rid of all our stuff and we moved into this RV, which we call Neshama, which is Hebrew for soul. I'm actually an ordained rabbi, though I don't work as such. And um, we, for the past several years, have spent, uh, several of you pointed out on seeing the RV, which is, by the way, down in the parking lot in the corner there, and you're welcome to join us afterwards. We'd love to give you a tour of it and show you some of the tips and techniques we use for full-time RV living. But some of you pointed out like, wow, you'd really have to love each other <laughs> to be in that small space. And we've done it four years now, and we absolutely love each other. In fact, it's kind of a miracle that you know, we're both here you know, sharing with you because in, on a certain level, We'd love to just spend all of our time together. That's how much we enjoy each other. Like we often wake up in the early morning and um, we've both had a lot of trauma in our past. Both of us had abusive dads. We both of us uh, were into religions. Um, Lynetta's was particularly cultish. And um, we've really struggled with a lot of life issues, family issues, relationship issues, spiritual issues. And um, we've done a lot of healing between the two of us every day. Like we've both been trained as life coaches and we've actually successfully trained, uh, helped coach each other. You know, when you get to our age, however old any of you are, you know, we all get triggered by something. Somebody speaks to us in a certain way or give, even gives us a look and you know, we get those emotional triggers. It's hard not to, but when something comes up, when you get to our age, if you're savvy, and I'm sure most of you are, you know that when a trigger's coming up, the person in front of you is the trigger, but they're not the cause. The cause is always something from the past, you're almost always going back to our childhood. And I can pretty much say by the time you're age 18, 20, everything that's going on in your life is just a re-triggering from the past. So Lynette and I, anytime the stuff comes up, what we do is, we team up together. You know, we realize, okay, I said something, Lynetta felt like, like one thing comes up, sometimes Lynetta gets a little irritated. 
Now, she's actually not getting irritated with what I say, but she's getting irritated because she thinks I'm rushing her, for example, because that's what her family always did. And I point out, no, not rushing. I just want to know, like, what time are we leaving to go to speak this morning? <laughs> and um, so we recognize that, and then what we do is we team up together, and then we clear whatever that issue is from the past. And we've been doing this, we've been actually together five years now, and 100% successfully cleared anything that's ever come up. And we actually just love being together. In fact, when something comes up, you know, normally like, you know, you know you have an energy with somebody and you're thinking like, oh God, I hope I don't run across them today, you know, or they don't say that to me or they don't give me that look. And it's like Lynette and I, like if something comes up, we're like, oh my God, cool. Can we get, can we like, you know, clear this together? Because it always works. Okay, pointer. Pointer, pointer. Oh, there it is. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. So that's a little bit about our background. And Lynette is going to share some other stuff. She, we're going to split the presentation. So what I want to talk about is um, we originally started this whole RV life because we wanted to be on the road. We actually both love being in nature. So we love going up to the forest, parks, and spending time in nature. And sometimes we'll do a lot of work there. And um, we also wanted to be on the road and to meet really cool people like all of you. And that was really why we did this. But there have been some huge benefits which I want to share with you now, in particular, benefits of spending less money, spending less time, and having less of an environmental impact by living in an RV full time. So let's do a little comparison. So if you're either renting a house or own a house and you're doing a mortgage payment, on average, you're probably spending somewhere between one to 2,000 a month. Now, in some areas, you go into the Bay Area, you go to LA, you could be spending 3,000, 3,500 or more on rent or a mortgage payment easily. Does that fit most of you here? Okay. Now, for the RV, we own our RV outright, and it was not very expensive, and there are lots of ways you can get one without spending a bundle of money. You can spend hundreds of thousands for RVs, and you can get an amazing RV for five to 10,000, which is what we did. Um, so we have no rent or mortgage payment. Now, sometimes we'll go to a national forest, for example, where you do have to pay to camp, but there's lots of free places you can camp, and that's not just friends and family, and that's one of the things that we'd be glad to share with you. So we spend maybe 100 a month in the equivalent of rent or mortgage. Utilities, electric, gas, water, sewer, all that fun stuff. Typically, you're probably spending about two to 250 a month in this area for all your utilities. Now, for us, we have propane, which runs our fridge and our heating. And we spend about 15 a month for that. And then we have to dump our black water. That's from our toilet. And there, there are actually free places here in Washington, a lot of them. But, you know, typically we might spend about 15 a month for that. And occasionally we'll be in a place where we have to buy some water. We'll actually go into the supermarket. We have some drinking jugs. And maybe we'll spend $5. So typically we'll spend about 35 a month for utilities. Now, Commuting costs. If you're working at a traditional job, you're not working at home, then you've got car costs. And from AAA, average car costs is about $700 a month, including car payment itself, insurance, gas, repairs. Now, for us, um, we've actually had our RV four years. This year, we had uh, two uh, significant repairs. Um, we had an oil leak. 
and a belt that broke. So I'd say about 300 a month covers our insurance, gas, repairs. So t in a typical house, again, renting or owning, and your living expenses, and commuting costs to traditional work, you're probably going to be spending at least two to 3,000 a month. Now our cost is probably about, let's say, 400, four to 500 a month. So we're saving at least 2,000 a month by living full-time in an RV. Now, to, to take care of that extra 2000 or so a month, you're going to be working a job to pay all those wonderful things you have to pay for. For the typical job in the United States, you're going to be working about 44 hours a week. Our equivalent to pay our expenses is about 15 hours a week. Then commuting time to work, average American spends 4.3 hours a week in commuting, about 26 minutes each way. But then if you live in a major city, you know, like LA, you could spend an hour and a half easily one way commuting. Some people can spend four hours or more a day commuting in LA, it's really terrible. So time-wise, you could be spending about 50 hours a week just to support your housing costs and living costs, and maybe we're spending about 15 hours a week doing the same. Now let's talk about environmental impact. A typical house spent, uses about 1,000 kilowatt hours, that's what Daniel spoke about earlier, uh, a month in electricity and that's in Oregon and or Washington. In Washington, 25%, even though we have a lot of hydropower here, 25% it still comes from burning fossil fuel like oil. In Oregon, 50% comes from burning fossil fuel, and in the US as a whole, 60%. So that electricity in your home is gonna be, a, a significant percentage is gonna be by burning oil or some other natural gas or something. Now for us, this past winter, we actually put a solar panel on top of our RV. Now I can't tell you how thrilled both of us are <laughs> when we're sitting anywhere on a sunny day and we just look at the battery voltage just going up, 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 and we're just sit we could be sitting in a parking lot, you know, at, at Safeway or at Home Depot, and we're getting charged up. It is the most amazing thing. And because, you know, again, as Daniel pointed out, we've, we've really carefully chosen all the items we use. Like we have two laptops, two iPads, two iPhones, but we have like DC to DC chargers so you don't go through the inverters. There's all these things you need to learn about RVs and how not to waste power. So we literally have one 100 watt panel on top, which only costs a couple hundred dollars to put in. And that's basically supplying all the electricity we need to run everything in the RV, assuming you get a sunny day. Now, it's gonna be a little more challenging now that we're starting to get some overcast weather. And gratefully, we're actually staying at Wendy's and she's allowing us to plug into electricity. So we are gonna need some electricity when we get those cloudy days. But if you're in mostly sunny weather, you can be totally off grid. And we love, um, in RV language, they call it boondocking where you just go off in a forest somewhere, like we went to um, Mount, Ho Mount Hood, right? Uh, what was the lake? Trillium. Trillium Lake. Oh my God, have any of you been there, Trillium Lake? <sighs> it is this gorgeous lake. It's one of these classic scenes. Oh, actually, that was the first picture. Do you, uh, wait, let me no, go. it's the first picture on my picture. Wait, 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 yeah, hold on, hold on, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> let me go back, yeah, back, back, back. No, Oh, sorry, no, it's not that one. Nope, sorry, Lynetta's got it, you're right. It's one of these picture-perfect places where you have a mountain in the background, this gorgeous lake, yeah, Mount Hood, yeah, and forest all around, and you have great phone service there, complete phone service, at least from Verizon. So all that work-at-home work stuff that David was talking about, you know, I support my clients on the road, 
and we're just sitting in the middle of the forest charging off solar electricity for free and we can literally go at least two weeks without needing any connection whatsoever. Oh yeah, it was a free campsite. There's ways to find these free campsites so we, we paid nothing for, and we could have stayed there two, three weeks needing no utilities, not having to do anything. We're like totally self-contained. And it's a real joy, and of course, you know, if disaster strikes, you know, like one of these wonderful volcanoes decides to erupt or, you know, the, er the uh, fault line offshore goes off, whatever, it's like, okay, sorry folks, but we're out of here. <laughs> you know, that it's a big advantage compared to, you know, you got a tiny home that's, you know, on a foundation in a community and something goes wrong in that area, you're a little bit stuck. So we really love the flexibility that we can just pick up and leave if we need to. And we kind of had the idea also that we would, um, in the summers, come up. We love the Northwest. You know, we love you all in Washington and Oregon. You know, the people are amazing. The environment's amazing. Uh, and winters suck. I don't need to tell you. <laughs> so we kind of had the thought that in the winters, we'd go south, you know, like Southern California, Arizona, whatever. Um, though this winter, it turns out this whole organization that we're all creating, the St. Paul's University, may be going so well that we may change our minds on that. But um, it's really been f a fabulous experience for us to be able to just have that complete flexibility to live anywhere we want and to be able to move our home. That's the one thing, you know, a tiny home versus an RV. Now, some, some tiny homes are foundation built, which means you're there. And some, you have one on wheels? Who? Crystal, like Crystal, right. Thank you. Yeah, you have one on wheels, you can move it. But the nice thing is, an RV is designed to move. It's got the engine there, and you just turn the ignition, and you're off. Mm -hmm. So, going back to the environment then. So, you save a huge amount on electricity, and you basically get charged for free, as long as you get some sun. And then water consumption. For a typical American household with two people, you're spending about 1,250 gallons per month of water. You know, a lot goes towards landscaping, flushing toilets, washer dryers, etc. For us, we spend about 40 gallons of water per month. That's it. So we have huge electricity savings, huge water savings. We have a little three-gallon propane tank, which we fill maybe twice a month, and it's about seven bucks a fill. And that runs our refrigerator, our um, heating, and our stove. We have four-burner stove in the RV. So cost-wise and environmental-wise and time-wise, RV living we found to be just fabulous, and the adventure part is even better. Now, our intention, as I mentioned at the beginning, was for us to be out in the world and to meet people and to share everything we've learned about how to live an awesome life. But I've gathered so much information after four years of full-time living, and we've upgraded almost all the systems in our RV, as, you, as you'll see when you uh, come down to see that I, I kind of got the idea a while ago, like, you know, it's really a shame not to share this with people who are really interested. So I've actually created a course that's just launching that is everything about RV living, especially if you don't have the experience yet. It's about the different classes of RV. There's what they call class A, B, and C, which is different sizes of RVs. RV engines, whether you get gasoline or diesel, ways you should get new or used. And then if you want to go, where do you go to find one? Different shopping apps, different sites. Then um, for maintaining and living in an RV, you need to know about all your basic systems. Now this includes whether or not you're going to be doing the work yourself or you're going to hire somebody. You still need to understand it because there's a lot of people in the industry who are just outright doing things wrong. For example, there's a lot of people who will put solar on your RV and they're doing it wrong, absolutely wrong, in a way that you're spending way more money than you need and your stuff is way less efficient than it should be. 
It's amazing how many people, and, they, and these are companies who may have been doing this 10, 20 years, but they're making some real basic mistakes. Like one thing Daniel pointed out was if you have a little bit of shade covering an RV panel, like you could have a big panel like this, which is what we have on our RV, and you cover just one corner with a, a little bit of shade. For example, you put it on top of the roof of your RV near one of your vents and you crank up the vent and you're covering that shade the panel output from one little corner being covered will drop by at least a third. You know, you think, oh, there's only one square out of 20 that's being covered, you know, you lose a few percent. No, the whole thing goes right down the tubes. Like placement of where you put these is essential. The kind of wiring you use, wiring is so important. Most people have no idea how important that is when you're doing DC versus AC. Daniel, of course, knows this. So you need to know about electrical systems, particularly if you're going to do solar. You actually have two electrical systems in RV. You have an AC, like your wall outlets, and then you've got the 12 volt, like all those battery things you plug in on your car. You need to go about heating and cooling and ventilation, water systems, cooking, sleeping. When you come down, I'm going to ask you to take a look under our bed, because you're going to see something I guarantee none of you have under your bed at home. And if you're living in an RV, you have to have that, which you're going to see there. Because if you don't, you're going to have mold growing under your bed. Ask us how we know. <laughs> um, storage, ways to maximize storage. When you come into the RV, go take a look in our oven. We don't use our oven uh, as an oven. <laughs> we use it for storage. Go take a look inside. Um, structural elements of L RVs. And then... How, again, this how to work from home, how to make money, as David was talking about, while you're on the road. Or, you know, you could be parked in a community. You might find a great community you want to live there. You know, how do you do the internet? How do you do your phone stuff? And then particularly, you know, me having a tech background, I have found a dozen apps at least I have on my iPhone. I'm glad to share that in this course as well for how to do navigation. Like, you, like Google Maps is great. And on certain levels, it sucks for an RV. Because, for example, there are height problems somewhere. You know, like certain things you can't go under. There are certain roads that might be too steep for you, either going up or going down. So there are apps specifically for RVs for navigation. And then places to park or camp overnight. I have about a dozen apps and websites that are phenomenal about, you know, if you want to do free stuff, you can find it. If you want to know, if you want to do paid and you want to know how good is this, you know, national park site or this state park or whatever, they'll have reviews of it. So all this is a two month class that's partly in the RV and then partly online to just give you all the ins and outs if you have any interest in pursuing this. So if you do, come speak to me afterwards, and uh, we'll get you signed up for that. So that's the basics of the RV living before I introduce Linetta. Anybody have any questions or anything they want to add in here? Anything I didn't address about the basics? Okay, so that was minimal living. Now, Lynetta is going to tell you, uh, yes, yes, David! <laughs> What can we do for you? I was a little, got a little excited about you saying that there's all of these places we don't know about until we see that they have with the alternatives to like the Walmart parking lot. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, yeah. Can you teach Sarah's a little bit with us what that might look like? You mean how do you find those sites? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Where Okay, so I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a couple quickies. Um, national forests. What national forests are nearby? Do, can you name one? Not a... S What's it called? Gifford Pinchot. Right, okay, that's a national forest. General rule in national forests is you can drive into any national forest. Now, sometimes they have a rule like you can't be within a certain distance of a road or an established campsite. It's the one thing, and every forest has their own rules slightly, but the basic rule is you can go into any national forest and pull off a road and camp. Um, could be at least 14 days. Some places may have limits, some places may not. Some places they don't check. Some places they don't check. Like we've gone to places where people are clearly just living there permanently. <laughs> so you can go into national forests 
pretty much for free, unless you go to a National Forest campsite, then you have to pay. And by the way, they're pretty cheap. They're often like $10 or $15 a night, which is a pretty good bargain on itself. And then Bureau of Land Management, they have own a huge amount of land, particularly in the Southwest. And a lot of those are free also. You just pull off the road and free camping as well. So um, there's an app called All Stays, A-L-L-S-T-A-Y-S. That's like our number one app that we use. And All Stays gives you... And it may be iPhone only. They used to have an Android version, but it may be iPhone only. Yeah, but it is a phenomenal app. And if you want, I'll show you afterwards. I can't pull it up on here. Um, you'll, you'll find everything you need for RV living. That's like a starting place. Is that good enough? Cool. Anybody else? Okay, so now, come on up, honey. Let's tell them about Maximum Love. All right. Thank <laughs> you. That concludes the fourth module of this five module series. Only one presentation to go, and this final presentation will be given by myself, Daniel Mark Schwartz from OffGridPermaculture.com. In this capstone module, I'll be discussing what it takes to build not only a healthy, happy lifestyle off-grid, but what it takes to build resilient systems and why real safety comes from the design of an off-grid homestead. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our final presentation of the morning and of the event, uh, Securing Your Future, a plan for off-grid resiliency and sustainability. And this is a lecture that really, I think, comes to the core of what it means to be safe, sustainable, and the path forward for um, modern systems. Uh, there's so much uncertainty out there in the world, you know, political uncertainty, environmental uncertainty, economic uncertainty, and to me, the way that we remedy that is by developing our own ability or our local ability to keep ourselves going, to generate our own food or grow our own food, to generate our own power, to have our own water. And I don't think that this is just a pipe dream or some kind of survivalist fantasy. It really comes down to the system that we've built and the practical and essentially mathematical calculations that go into how do we survive as a species? And that's why I chose um, to be my main study, uh, or the main venue in which I present my, my studies, which is offgridpermaculture.com. So I'm the main author there, as well as the author of an upcoming book about off-grid permaculture, as well, and an in-depth course, which I'm putting together on these subjects. Because I, I really want to teach people how to survive in any environment, in any situation, and to keep our society, our great society, ever moving forward. Um, and it comes down to two parts, off-grid, which is the ability to maintain while being disconnected. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to be disconnected or, you know, living alone in a cabin in the middle of the woods. If you want to, that's cool. If not, you have that option should the need arise. The other uh, part of the title that I've chosen is permaculture, which is a whole study in itself. Um, and it has certain connotations that I like to bring along with it. But really, I love the word permaculture, which is a portmanteau of permanent and agriculture, but also human culture. So we're building a society that is able to sustain human culture indefinitely in the future. And specifically today, I'm talking about how do we secure our future? How do you secure your future individually, as a community, as a family, and then hopefully trickling up to our nations and countries as a whole? So this talk is going to be in three big parts. The first is, what does the future hold for us? You know, it's hard to plan for a future if you don't really understand what it can be. If you choose the wrong, you know, future um, predictions, you're likely to spend a lot of time or make moves that are in the complete wrong direction. So I'm going to spend probably quite a bit of this talk going over why I believe the future holds what it does and what that means for uh, us going forward.
the second part is, is there hope? You know, there's a lot of gloomy predictions out there. There's a lot of uh, naysaying and, you know, a lot of defeatism, honestly. Well, what can I do? Well, there's really a lot that we can do. And emerging now, you know, this year, this decade, even in the, you know, since the beginning of the century, there's so much out there technological wise. Um, we have so much opportunities now that we've never had in the past to develop these systems. Or that if we did have in the past, we're so hampered by the communication means that we had at the time and our ability to get together and work together as a community that now I think we're in the best um, shape that we've ever been to really get a open source permaculture future started as a, as a community, as people for ourselves and our families. And then the last part, um, which I think is the most important, is how do we get started with this? You know, this shouldn't just be a sitting on the couch, wow, this is a great idea. Or, you know, I like watching videos about it, which, you know, everybody should, but we also need to get out there and we need to spend time with our hands in the dirt and, you know, get the wrenches out, get the hammers out and let's build something and let's actually do this and live a better life because it's not about sacrifice. It's not about being the most, you know, austere and being so proud of the sacrifices you've made for the environment or, you know, for whatever it is or about being the one to survive. It's really about we're taking our life at the level it is and going up to an even greater level than we ever thought was possible before. And that's really the most exciting thing about this whole, the whole part. But before we get into that, you know, what is the future? And I, I put this Star Wars role right here because that is the vision of the future that we've been told. Hyper-technological, um, basically unlimited resources, unlimited power, um, and uh, the limited universe to explore. But the, the unfortunate reality, as much as I love Star Wars and you know, love science fiction, is that probably we're going to be lim stuck with a very limited set of resources. So here are predictions for uh, crude, well, predictions and past history of crude oil production. Right, and the the mathematics behind how this works is that production of finite resources has an exponential increase, like you can see on the left of this graph. And then as we start saturating what is there, you know, there's no matter how much of something we have, there's always a limited amount of it. There's no such thing as infinite in the universe. So as we get towards the limit of what that particular supply is, then we start tapering off and eventually we have to go down. And so, you know, what we are seeing here with oil is that we're already peaking. And uh, there's been a lot of talk about peak oil in the past and Oh, well, you know, now that we have um, fracking, we've got more oil. And yes, that's true. We're pushing the curve up a little bit. But it doesn't matter how much oil we find. There's always going to be a limited amount, and these curves always apply. And even if we do develop a system that is even uh, able to completely replace oil, you know, whatever it is, nuclear or solar panels or something else, all of those things require resources. Some of them are very rare resources, which we'll get more into a little bit later in this lecture. But human technology always takes things. It always takes substances, materials, and there's just only so many of these materials. And so if we're building a system which has rapid economic growth, exponential growth, then there's going to be a problem at some point because all exponential growth ends up flattening off. You see this all across the natural world, right? If you put, let's say, some bacteria in a petri dish in the center, they're going to grow exponentially hour by hour, day by day, until they start filling it up. And then they're going to you know, level off in a typical S-curve. And we're seeing the S-curve too. And the, the problem for our societies and how we organize ourselves is that we've built our whole structure around exploiting the rapid increase of the S-curve. And now we're getting to the point where we have to leave off that strategy. Like the Buddha said, when you get across the river, don't carry the raft with you. Right? I think it was fine what we've done. And, and not necessarily fine. I mean, there's, there's problems with everything we've outlined, but the strategies that we've, our ancestors used in the past have worked to get us to a position to where we are now capable of making new and even better systems which are suitable for uh, the top of this S-curve. And so how really significant is this growth? Well, this graph is so telling. It is the, number, the estimated GDP in 2011 dollars since the birth of Christ. And this influx of energy around the begin, you know, around the start of the 1800s mostly, but really in the whole industrial era, 
has led us to have huge off the chart growth. Now this growth cannot be maintained. All right? People say sometimes, oh, well, we'll just go to Mars or we'll go find another planet or asteroid, but exponential growth can overtake anything. All right? If we're doubling the amount of resources that we use in 15 years, every 15 years, all right, if it took us 100 years to use up the entire world, some resources, just, you know, maybe 200 years, whatever, then how long will it take us to use up the next world, you know, Mars or whatever planets, even if it does have as much resources as Earth does, which doesn't seem likely? Well, it could be in 50 years, you know. If it took us a thousand years to use up the world, then it could be, you know, 100, 200 years to use up the next planet, and then 50 years the next, and then 10 years the next. Like, there's not enough planets within the light, like the, the space time or with, uh, within the speed of light of Earth to constantly supply us at that growth rate. This growth rate cannot be maintained. And what this really comes down to is we need to overcome these fantasies of the future, right? This is um, an 1882 artist's depiction of what it's going to be like to go to the opera in the year 2000. And that's amazing in that it is not at all correct, but also they thought we we're going to be going to operas. You know, the, the mind at that time was not able to conceive of the type of lifestyle that we would have now because not many people go to operas. You know, we have other forms of, of entertainment. But these concepts of this hyper-technological future from around that time period still are persistent in the very core of how we've designed our systems and what we think about ourselves and I think of where we're going. So if we're planning for this future, which has already been proven not to exist, then we're planning for... Um, well, we're, we're not planning for what's actually going to happen, and we're leading ourselves to a catastrophe. And, you know, this isn't the first time that we've been on the brink of collapse. There's been uh, many societal collapse in the past, and one I'd like to highlight that's particularly interesting is uh, the collapse that this man presided over. This is uh, the pharaoh Ramses III. Um, you may have heard of his father being the pharaoh that's often talked about in the stories of the Bible and Moses. Um, but Ramses III was considered to be one of the last great, if not the last great pharaoh of Egypt. Well, what happened? Right? In the writings that we have and the depictions on the walls of, that we have, they, they talk about the incoming invasion of a large number of peoples, of nomadic peoples from the north, where it's believed to be from the north, we don't know exactly where they came from, that at the time they called the Sea Peoples. And that's kind of just the story that we knew from the past, there wasn't that much data on it. But over the recent history, there's been a lot of, uh, more interesting and more in-depth archaeological finds, and we have more technology that's able to bring out the meaning of these relics. And so in his uh, really astounding book, 1177, The Year Civilization Collapsed, Eric Klein, professor, has laid out the full story of what we know happened, or of what it is that we know of what happened. We don't know everything that happened, but we have some really amazing evidence. Now that we have better linguistic capability, they found shards of communications from that era, and we know for sure that there was a global, or at least a, a pan-Europe and Asia trade network that spanned all of the major civilizations that were known to exist at the time. This is, the, besides the modern era, this is the only other time in history that we've known for sure that, that there was that wide of a trade network. And if you look at the evidence of what had happened, there was invasions, there was widespread societal and technological collapse, like writing pretty much ended. Um, in you know, large quantities of writings were not found from the period immediately after this collapse. Um, but there was economic collapse too. And there were disasters and all kinds of things. So it's hard to really nail down exactly what it was. But it's looking more and more like whatever started this, we know for sure led to the complete um, systemic collapse of the way that these societies worked. Right? All of their systems of organization, all their trade routes, all the stuff that they had built up in this technology and the, being the Bronze Age of bronze um, was left in the dust, and it took hundreds of years for them to build up to the level of technology that they had after this, right? And a lot of it has to do with the fact that they were limited um, access to important strategic resources, particularly tin. So how, you know, impactful was this? 
Well, these great societies, the Minoans, the Mycenaeans, the Trojans, the Hittites, the Babylonians, you know, these are people who were able to build the, you know, the Colossus of Rhodes, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, of course, the, all the wonders of Egypt. Every single one of these societies was eradicated, except for Egypt. Um, they were left in a state so weak that they basically never attained the glory of ancient Egypt ever again. That was the end of all these peoples. So is, is this, you know, the potential that we're going to fall into? Well, what are we looking at in particular? It's not really the sea peoples. But here's a list of things that, based on all of the evidence out there that I've looked at, seems to be the most important um, pain points that we're going to be looking at in the future. Now, I'm not saying we're going to get hit any of these or we're going to hit all of them. Um, but these are, if you're considering, um, how I put this, if you're looking at what could be, you know, if you're preparing for a car crash that you hope never happens, you're going to be looking at these elements because these are the most uh, poignant or the most important upcoming um, potential catastrophes. One is falling energy supply, right? We've, we've been able to replace a certain amount of our energy with other systems, but we're so linked in petroleum. And even if we do make a switch to uranium-based systems or, you know, maybe even far future systems, the amount of our, you know, our ability to produce these in large quantities takes decades to ramp up. You know, even if everybody on the planet decided, okay, let's build a nuclear reactor to cover all of our capabilities. Well, there's only, last time I've checked out, there was only one company capable of building nuclear reactor containment vessels, right? And they're booked out for 10 years. Like, we just can't build them that quickly. So we, no matter what route we go, renewables, not renewable, uh, we probably are going to have an energy problem. Scarcity of key, re key resources. Countries like China and companies all over the world are already fighting for rare earth metals. These metals are the key component to much of our technology, to batteries, to all these amazing new systems that we're building that are supposed to save the planet. Yet we're already running into scarcity issues with many of these resources. You know, they're called rare earth for a reason. And, and it might be that we can build up systems that don't require these. And I know there's some research going into that already, but as of now, we have no real viable alternative. And it could be that these uh, rare earth resources will be the keystone that crumbles and all of our technological advancement could crumble along with it. The next big thing is insufficient food production. At the current moment, we are producing enough food to feed the planet. Um, unfortunately, not all of it gets the, the right hands. But it's so linked into our technological system and into other failing resources like water, which I'll talk about in a couple of bullet points down. Now, it's very likely that this system of production can't continue. We're looking at things like large mono, um, mono agricultural systems, so where they're only planting one crop at a time, like bananas, are uh, at um, extreme danger for mass disease because there's not enough diversity to ensure that we have a resistant strain or a resistant variety of these plants around to protect us. Right? So it could be and we're seeing this with bananas in particular, that some super bug uh, erupts and because it's got such a huge fertile land full of that particular banana tree or that particular wheat crop or that particular soybean, that it will just run rampant and destroy the entire world supply or a huge majority of it. Even a 15% or 20% decrease in the supply of any key good could drive up the prices so much as to cause some an economic downward spiral, kind of like the fall in the housing prices caused an economic spiral in 2008, and rising food prices again caused an economic spiral that led to the Great Depression. Partial and total like environmental collapse, this one's difficult to predict because we don't have no real good models for how the environment's going to react. And there's been some evidence presented already that the models that we've been operating off of for these CO2 models are not necessarily the best, but we don't really know. I mean, we know the environment is changing. We don't know if it's natural. There's good evidence that it's linked to human activity. But you know, is there a tipping point? You know, is it going to be fine? We don't know. And in particular, it's linked to weather. And we know for sure that weather is a chaotic system. Um, as it is, even if we had perfect knowledge of all of the variables of the weather system, so we knew all the temperatures across the planet, we knew all the wind speeds and everything like that, and we had the perfect uh, equations to calculate it out, we would still only be able to tell the, the weather about a week in advance. Right? This is the nature of these systems. It's like putting an egg on the very 
top of a roof peak, right? You, it's so, um, so touchy that it could fall in either direction and have major consequences. You know, did it go left off the roof or right off the roof? It's way different positioning, but it comes down to a just very minuscule adjustment at that key point. And that's how the Earth's weather systems go. And that's how environmental collapse would proceed. So we just don't know what's going to happen. Another big thing that is talked about, but I don't think enough, is the falling world aquifer supply. Much of um, much water for the irrigation of crops, um, water for that go into large cities, and uh, just general human use comes from these deep, uh, ancient aquifers. You know, from deep wells, and these are falling every year, especially in heavy agricultural areas like the Midwest of the United States. Almost all the aquifers in the United States are falling. I do have a map on this in the future. In the Northwest here, where we are, we actually have been all right um, to some extent. But uh, falling water across the board nationally is always an issue because it's so linked to agricultural production. right? And so where one aquifer begins to fail, they're going to be looking for relief, whether it's moving agricultural production to another location or bringing water from our location down there. And Overall, we're in a tough situation. And the final is global economic depression or systemic collapse. And I think this is probably the most likely to occur because once pressure goes on a system, it will bend, 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 and then break. So I don't see us mining you know, or drilling up every last bit of oil on the earth. More likely what's gonna happen is we're gonna get to the point where we have falling production and that will lead to whatever outcome, you know, whether non-functioning government, wars, invasions like the Sea Peoples, um, or you know, almost any of these other catastrophes could be linked to that as well. And then we'll end up stop stop stopping uh, we'll end up stop drilling these oil reserves. So any one of these issues could lead to a systemic collapse, or could be linked with a systemic collapse, and it could be that any or all of these could happen. So that leads me to what hope do we have? Is there any way that we can protect ourselves from this? You know, do I need to vote for somebody? Do I need to, you know, build a house in the country with a year's worth of canned goods? Well, this is how I see it. The key to overcoming this is building what I would call it in based on this graph, a distributed system. Right now, our systems are very centralized. You know, 60% of all the food in the United States is sold by the top five um, grocery store chains. More and more of our agricultural production, more and more of our general manufacturing is being concentrated into the one or two factories in China and the one or two giant chicken producers in the United States or what have you. There's an increasing move towards centralization. The problem with centralization is you have a key you know, a keystone in the center, and when that falls or if anything happens to that, everybody loses um, access to the resources that they need. Now, the motion in the right direction is to move towards decentralization to where we have regional or community-based production, and especially production of key resources like food, water, and um, housing, energy. If we get those in place, then we can work up to the nicer things like technology and so forth. But if we have the ability to produce what we need, you know, even if technology goes away in a distributed or central decentralized system, then we'll be much safer. And then, of course, the ultimate goal in my mind is decentralized or dis distribution, to where we have multiple interconnected, um, yet mostly independently functioning communities. And so, why am I saying this? Why is distributed such a big deal? Well. If you look at the research that we've looked into, what happens if there is a large scale catastrophe? A lot of this was done during the Cold War era. And, uh, you know, scientists and intellectuals were looking at what would happen if there was a nuclear attack. You know, military people, people, experts in logistics, all of it looked at, looked at this. And what did they do? Well, they built strings of independently, you know, manageable um, military bases and underground bunkers like in this photo. And they built the internet which is ground up designed to be functional no matter what happens. You can cut any subset of people off from any other subset of people and mostly have, well, you'll have a completely functioning computer network. 
Now, since then, we've built up the, the web and other technologies on top of it that don't necessarily function that well in a distributed or decentralized manner. But there's nothing stopping us from using the internet technology to rebuild up that decentralized system. And people have already been doing that. We're going to talk a little bit about that later. But so this Cold War idea can be taken from the spectrum of warfare into the spectrum of peace. And as a permaculturist, I'm really interested in looking at how nature works in the regard of modeling its basic concepts and systems in the, the human, um, the system of human endeavor and trying to build up a system that is beneficial for, for everybody. And I think a good system, like the measure of a good design would be to move us into being essentially like weeds, right? Weeds are basically impossible to destroy. Right? Compare that to a farmer's field. Right? Farmers are constantly having to put pesticides on and water and uh, maybe even weed or do whatever it takes to keep these crops going. Right? So many crops that we have would not function without having relatively, excuse me, relatively constant inputs from an external source. And a lot of this has to do with energy. But weeds, they don't need that. We have to act, put energy into stopping them. Every day, you know, you have to go out and cut the grass and, well, not every day, but every day people are going out and cutting the grass and weeding and doing all this stuff to get rid of these weeds. But many of them do have beneficial properties, like dandelions are edible, they produce, uh, they're rel very healthy, right? So what, we need a system like a dandelion that produces good things for everybody and is basically unstoppable. It's resilient and flexible. So resilient means you could cut a huge swath out of these dandelions and come back in a year and you'll bet they'll be back. You could cut every single one of these down and remove a layer of the dirt and you'll probably get dandelions again the next year. Dandelions are flexible. They don't need a particular environment to grow in. They can grow anywhere. They can grow in a parking lot. They can grow in the forest. They can grow you know, in the cold and the heat. And they spread naturally. And that's a big one because a lot of people are talking about building up these, you know, communities or whatever it is that are essentially a type of penance, it seems like, or there's, you know, there's a bit of a saintliness around abstaining for the sake of the environment or the, for the sake of protecting your family or whatever it is. And there, there might be a certain amount of, you know, abstaining from certain activities, but I think our system were to really work needs to be exciting. It needs to be uh, something that people want to do, right? Nobody had to go around and proselytize capitalism so, that much, right? Once they got started and people saw what the, the fruits are, you know, even this day, if you go to, to native communities, unfortunately, many of them are being gutted because the young people want to come and they want to live in the cities and they want to live a capitalist lifestyle. Well, if we're going to move past the system that we have now into a newer system that's even better, all right, we're going to need to design it in a way or, you know, to let it grow around us organically in a way that people want to do it. Right? They'll look at their lives now at their nine to five and look at the lives that's possible out on a, or, you know, off-grid permaculture homestead. And they'll say, well, I want, I want to live the off-grid lifestyle. That's so much better. Right? Yeah, I might not get to do X and Y, but I have so much for more fulfillment and safety and good food and good people. And so it has to be a step up. So what can we do to move towards decentralized technology? And this is why I think we're really in the forefront of this. Like now is the time to strike because it's going to happen. And there, here's three, um, you know, among many examples of what I consider to be fairly successful yet early stage developments toward developing a decentralized um, society. You know, and one big thing about this is I'm not advocating that we go back to 1860. Right? I'm not saying that we should go you know, put on the bonnets and canned goods necessarily. I mean, I love doing all that stuff, but I think the new society needs to take elements from the old as well as elements from the new. And so the new is we're going to have computers around, we're going to have technology. And so, you know, the three ones I'm going to look at right now real quickly is cryptocurrency, small scale production, and open technology. Now, cryptocurrency, you may have heard about in the news. It's kind of like a speculator's dream. And you know, there's a lot, been a lot of ups and downs in prices on some of these, but that doesn't really matter because what it's showing is that these systems are capable of handling billions of dollars worth of exchange. And they're being stress tested, there's real money in it now, and it's working. 
So what's so great about cryptocurrency? You know, what is it really? Well, it's a way of exchanging goods, you know, having a currency, but it has a ton of benefits over traditional fiat currency, as it's called, or the government just says this is worth this much. The biggest one is distributed access. You don't need a credit card processor. There's no corporate offices that manage this. There's no Federal Reserve banks, right? Cryptocurrency, like anybody could start one if they wanted. Um, it's completely distributed. So right now on your computer, you could start a node of one of these cryptocurrencies, which means you're in the processing network. You can make transactions. You can make new accounts. And no one has to give you permission, right? And it'll work. If you and your neighbor are still have your node up, you can still make transactions between each other um, without necessarily having to, you know, reconnect Im immediately back to the full system. And along with this, there's no centralized control. There's no committee that says we're going to devalue the currency, revalue the currency, set interest rates. It's completely uncontrollable, actually. You cannot stop these currencies once they've started. It's kind of like you know, illegal file sharing, BitTorrent, that kind of thing, right? They've been, the movie industry and the governments have been putting billions of dollars into ha tamping down these movie sharing services. And they haven't been able to. They've tried and tried and tried, but people are still downloading movies illegally every single day. And like this, there's nobody that can stop Bitcoin or these other um, cryptocurrencies at when they're in place. So there's, you know, a ton more development to, to be going on to uh, there's a ton more development work that needs to be put into these and um, so on and so forth. You know, Bitcoin or Ripple or whatever, it may not be the right one, but we're moving in a way to where this can be a replacement for the future. And it's also great because it does have um, adaptability, right? You can fork these currencies, but it's not down to any one decision. It essentially is put your money where your mouth is. So when somebody forks, it means you basically split your money off from the main system. And if you have a majority of people that follow on with that fork, so we need to amend the system, we need to change the rules, then you can split these out. You know, these people split out, and once you have a critical mass, essentially, everybody will probably move and you have a new system. And this has actually already happened with Bitcoin at least once. Another big aspect is most of these currencies are deflationary, which means after a certain amount of time, there's no more new Bitcoins coming out. And this, I think, is very key, and I'm not going to get into the depths of this because this could be a whole nother talk, but if you're at all interested in this monetary issues, I would consider, or I'd recommend that you read the book Sacred Economics by Charles Eisenstein, pictured here. And basically what the crux of his argument in this book is that inflationary monetary systems inevitably lead us to devil's bargains where we'll sell out ourselves and our future to get money because inflationary systems, especially with interest-bearing um, systems which we have now, you know, so banks giving interest and so forth, lead us to do anything we can to convert resources into money because money keeps well, you can't lose it, and it tends to grow as an investment. So that's all I'll say about that, but very interesting. Another big move is going back to local production. Right? If we're incumbent or um, if we're indebted to China to produce all of our goods or whoever it is, you know, the big factory across the United States, then there's so many more avenues to cut us off from that supply. There's also a lot more avenues to control that supply, which is why people are pushing it, people at the top, because they want to control you because it makes them money or gives them power. Local production is a um, gives us the potential to do design differently, which I'll talk a lot about more in a little bit here, but also to get uh, raw materials locally. So what are we doing in this realm right now? Well, one big development is 3D printing. Now, it's probably mostly used for a little, you know, gimmicky stuff. There is definitely a use for it in industry. It's being used very heavily in industry, actually, for prototyping and so forth. But this, this whole concept of having a, you know, CNC, basically a computer that builds items locally out of raw materials from plans that you source on the internet, you know, it's like a printer. And that you, we've seen how, you know, vast the effect of printers have been on the printing industry. And now we have print-on-demand books. You know, there's so many things that you needed to copy for, you needed to copy by hand, or just the whole way that we work with printed materials has changed dramatically since the advent of the printer. And I think that the advent of, you know, plastic printers, 
uh, metal printers and other 3D, you know, real-time CNC fabricating devices, uh, which are just exploding right now, give us the possibility of producing more and more of our manufactured good locally, built especially for what you need as you need them, and potentially to your design, which is the, the next point I'll get up to. But before I talk about that, one big thing people ask, okay, well, if we're going to be off-grid or whatever, how are we going to get the materials? And there has been some work into this, and there's a lot more room for growth. But essentially, you know, for instance, plastics, we don't need to use petroleum plastics. Before petroleum, we had plant-based plastics, and we still do have some, but there's a lot more room for growth in this area. Likewise with, you know, other materials, well, they'll need to be worked on, but that can be done incrementally. As once we start producing goods locally with our own machines, then there'll be a lot more incentive for people to go out and figure out, well, can I grow this? You know, how do I make this locally? There's real money in it at that point, and then we have a lot of possibility for growth at that point. Another, uh, or well, the third point in this little vein that I'm really interested in is open source technology. Open source technology means the plans, the design, and the, the permissions to use this design is granted, and it's all basically done as community contributions. Um, this type of development has a lot of benefits. One is that you can make it legally uh, locally. So this synergizes with what we were talking about before. The other thing is right now how engineers design for corporations is they need to build a profit that makes money. And a lot of making money is, well, we, we can't supply something that lasts too long because otherwise we would not be able to sell to people again, right? Now, not, I'm not saying every engineer is out there trying to, you know, potentially gimmick their product, but pervading in the industries is the notion that I need to keep customers around. And so there's a movement towards devices which you have to pay for over and over and over again. Whereas the, we haven't really put as much brain power, if any, towards how do we build a device that lasts 100 years, 200 years without need for maintenance, you know, without need for <coughs> replacement parts or minimal need for replacement parts. Plus, we unleash the, when we allow people to modify plans, so let's say I could take, you know, the design of my tractor, say, and add a little bit of an improvement here and a little bit of improvement there. You know, there's thousands or tens of thousands of tinkers around that are interested in this stuff and they figure out one good thing here, one good thing there, we can incrementally, incrementally and evolutionarily improve the designs to the point where no team of engineers, no matter how smart, would have been able to think of all these things. Right? These designs can be vetted and tested over and over and over again, and there's no need for the newest, greatest you know, car that comes out next year. Like, okay, you, you want to print something cool and different? That's up to you. But the core building blocks that are in, in our society don't need to change that much. So if we get one or two really good engine designs, maybe that's all we need. And the third thing, or the fourth thing is everything would be inspectable, which gives us a unique freedom that we don't have now. There's so much going on in the electronics that we're buying that we, you know, we could be being um, spied on, you know, there could be security vulnerabilities and more and more we're finding about, out about this stuff. And a lot of it exists only because we have no way of knowing what's in there or no easy way. With open source technology, you're given the opportunity to inspect, you know, maybe you are not particularly an expert in that particular field, but it gives people around you and your community that are not part of a particular organization or company to the chance to look at these things. And so we know what's going on. So is this even possible? Well, open source is already winning in software, right? If you look at the Linux operating system or other open source operating systems, they have a huge dominant market share when it comes to things like supercomputers, website delivery, um, you know, Google uses it, Amazon uses it, all these big people. Heck, increasingly, even Microsoft, the, the, you know, the arch enemy of open source essentially, has been moving on that side. It's, you know, it's, it seems to be inevitable that open source is taking over. And I think that there's a place for us, for open source hardware and open source permaculture to take over in the same way and to show that it is an intrinsically superior system to the competitive capitalist system that we have now. Why is this? Well, the web and social media have given us the opportunity for this interchange of information and this, you know, collective growth 
that we just didn't have in the past, right? Trying to do open source in the 70s, people were kind of doing it, but it's just so difficult. Now, with this information sharing technology that we have, you know, even if it's simple things like growing tomatoes, right? You, you know people in community growing tomatoes, and by posting pictures on your, on, you know, whatever social media or communicating through forums or with people with like-minded interests as you, we'll be able to magnify human creativity to the point that, you know, our ancestors would have thought was basically impossible. It goes from, you know, a hundred years ago, it might have been like a three or four week round trip to have a conversation with somebody, you know, via letters and writing and all that stuff. And now we can have a communication across the planet instantaneously. Like there's so much potential there that is currently untapped and it's just going to grow and grow and grow. So lastly, how do we get started doing this? Well, I would say we need to start at the bottom. You know, a lot of people are looking at higher technology things. Um, there's a lot of interest out there and really cool stuff, but I think what we need to be focusing on are four key targets. One, energy. We need the ability to light our houses, heat our houses, heat up our water for cleaning and for cooking, and to store food. We need the ability to have independent water and waste systems. We need the ability to produce our food locally, and we need the ability to build and maintain sustainable housing. I think if we get those four things down, then we're, we have such a solid basis to continue on this project, you know, and to start checking out of elements of the previous system that may not serve us, like working 40, 50, 60 hour work weeks, you know, or having the whole family out of the house constantly doing, you know, traveling around, driving, buying stuff, right? We can move towards where we're spending more time developing the things that we like to do, living the life that we want. So first thing, solar here. It's cheap and it is legal, right? I, I can show you the references, but essentially the current opinion is that, yes, we do have the right to produce our own energy. And it's thought that the Constitution, through its wording, guarantees this right. Now, we haven't really tested that in court. I haven't found any cases where, you know, this is really seriously infringed upon. Now, they can legislate against, you know, beauty guidelines. So if you live in a HOA or something that's more restrictive, they can say, well, we don't like the look of those. But as of now, you know, finding the right spot, you have the ability to produce your own power, right? It's, solar is a great way to get started because everybody can learn it. It's not really that difficult. Um, I wish it's something that every high school student learned. And I think, you know, 20 years from now, it could be the case that every high school student comes out of high school knowing how to set up their own system and all the main components. But really, you know, with the way I teach it and the, all this information you can find online, it doesn't have to be intimidating. There's not really that much to it. And we can get all the parts now shipped. You know, Amazon will ship it to your door or whoever you're buying from. Like, it's just so easy to get started. And the next thing is water. All right, so this is a map I talked about earlier about the aquifer issues that we're having. And it comes down to it, almost every major aquifer in the United States is decreasing from moderately to extremely rapidly. Now, in the Northwest, we actually have seen some increase, but as I said before, if all of the rest of this fails, you know, our little pocket of water up here is not long for this world. So what can we do to get around this? Well, one easy thing is gray water systems, right? We're flushing a lot of water down the drains that is moderately dirty. What is gray water? You know, bath water, other, you know, like dish water, stuff that isn't really dangerous, but it needs to be, um, well, it can be reused. And if it ties in, it ties in real well with the idea of growing your food locally to be reusing these, this water instead of sending it straight to the treatment plant, we'll have some form of local moderate treatment or using it in a way that's still safe, right? Food scraps down the drain are great to go into the compost pile and into the garden. That's a perfect place for it, not in the drain. Um, combined with this, we can use improved gro growing practices to moderate the use of our water. And what it comes down to is that agriculture is the main use of water. Um, there's just tons and tons of this water being used to grow our food, but by growing it locally in rain gardens, food forests, you know, one of this, you know, any number of these plethora of new growing methods that are coming out and being shown to be super effective, we can grow food with much less water than we're using now at a commercial scale. Another big thing we can look at is getting water from other sources, you know, rainwater collection, cheap, easy. I think everybody should be using it at some point. It just falls into the basin, right? All we gotta do is collect it. Uh, surface water sources and shallow well sources are also something to consider. A lot of places, this is not necessarily, um, 
explicitly allowed as a source of drinking water, but it can be used. And so I, I present a lot of this in more detail in my, you know, more in-depth courses on the subject. But the great part about all these systems is we're also less dependent on the current energy and manufacturing system because many of these systems have no or zero, you know, or very few moving parts. You don't generally need pumps. Um, if you design your system well, you don't generally need all this apparatus and electricity that we have that's associated with deep water pumps. Right? And so if we're trying to build a resilient system, even though we're producing our water from our own well, say, if we need, if we you know, absolutely rely on these pieces of technology around us, electricity, then we could be up a creek <laughs> very quickly um, if we don't address that too. Another big thing with the water is we're throwing so much money down the toilet, literally, because we're spending tons and tons on these uh, handling, processing, and storing of waste. Even if you have a septic, you're basically just storing most of the waste to pay somebody with a truck to come get it later. This waste is actually useful, and I've found two great uses for it. In fact, I believe you can actually use both of them if you like. <coughs> Excuse me. One is, of course, composting the waste. And there's a number of systems for this composting, built-in toilets. It could be as simple as, you know, a bucket, and it doesn't have to be unhygienic or anything. Now, you can have a nice bathroom, but still use the waste, um, handle it safely, and there's proper composting techniques for this. And then at the end, you get wonderful, you know, sanitary uh, earth, like completely indistinguishable from any other earth, because a lot of earth actually came from poop. That's where it comes from. So we can build this composting system, low tech, you know, anybody can do it in a weekend in your home and get, you know, expensive compost out of stuff you would have paid to get rid of anyway. The other big thing I love is biogas. And this is the idea of where we're taking, you know, potentially human waste, other waste from around the garden, stuff that we'd have to pay to get rid of, or, you know, you might compost, but instead of doing that first, you're basically composting it in a uh, methane collector. So biogas is methane. And this has been shown to be effective um, in certain places in Europe, particularly Germany. This has been, been used since uh, you know, the 40s and 50s in a large scale. And they're producing large volumes of methane, which they use for energy production. We can use it for cooking, for heating, um, locally, you know, in your own home. And there's systems for this too that you can build, you can buy. Um, so why would we pay to get rid of this or you know, flush it down the toilet when we have this wonderful resource there for us to use. You know, food, a lot of people wonder, can we really grow our food locally? Well, yes. Um, there was an in-depth study done by the University of California. Um, I have the link if anybody's interested, but what it comes down to, what they, you know, their conclusions are that 9% of Americans can grow all of their food within 100 miles of their home. You know, and that's even people, you know, a lot of Americans live in major cities, you know, live in Arizona, like places that are not great or either too dense or not great for growing stuff. So if you live anywhere a little bit outside of a city, you're way, you know, you have a leg up already. Um, and I didn't put on the slide, but another follow-up was that if you want to grow within 50 miles of your home, well, 80% of Americans can do that, according to their an analysis. And if we just put a little effort into redesigning how our cities are and where people live and how we work, we can easily make this be 100%. It's not even an issue at all. America is great. We have so much opportunity to grow own food and live healthy, um, I wish more people would take it. You know, and food, it grows on trees. <laughs> Money doesn't grow trees, but food does. All we need is the skills. You know, it doesn't have to be a super expensive venture. I'm sure there's lots of companies, and Home Depot would love you to go and buy all the stuff that they're selling. But you don't need it. You just need a little bit of knowledge, and you need a little bit of understanding, and the you know the willingness to go and try out things. There's so many techniques available. Um, I just urge you, you know, if you're not going to follow any of the techniques specifically that I have on my website, um, look for techniques that don't require large amounts of external inputs, like large quantities of water or fertilizer and all this stuff. Find the organic, natural stuff where you're making your own fertilizer, you know, so composting, so on and so forth. Um, getting near the end here, natural building. And there's so much to be said about this, but the way we build is hugely wasteful. You know, the majority of the material in our landfills comes from building, uh, you know, refuse from building projects. And the way we build our buildings is, is not designed well for the environments that they're in. You know, a lot of them are designed for Southern California, and most of us don't live in Southern California. And even if you do, there's a lot that can be done in those areas to improve 
energy efficiency and improve um, the design of the homes to where they're more comfortable living and more uh, sustainably, more sustainable to operate. So there's a couple of methods that I really am a proponent of that I've used and I found to be uh, great, easy to learn, and um, produce a great result. So some of these are cob, straw bale, adobe, and earth. Earth building in general. Right? The earth building has been used for thousands of years and has a wonderful track record. And combined with modern sensibilities, modern building techniques, but not a lot of modern technology, we can build cheap buildings, do it yourself. All right, so here's a, an example of a building like the one I showed you in the previous picture, but under construction. Now, I've personally have taught these techniques to middle school children, and they they can do it no problem. Like anybody can learn how to do this. You know, it may be more of an issue to train you to be a carpenter or a finished carpenter or something like that, but anybody can build with earth, and it's readily available. Most building sites you can use the earth in place there, maybe with a little bit of clay added or something and so forth. But you can use a material right there to build the house. All right, if we can use, uh, well, earth building also interfaces more easily with found and minimally processed materials like those uh, wonderful natural looking beams that we saw in the previous picture, like on the roof there, that we can use these materials that are cheaper, that you may already have on, your, on the site or near the site, and just save a ton of money um, do it yourself, build something that you like, and use a number of techniques, you know, passive solar, um, more modern and very interesting design techniques to build a house that people actually like instead of these McMansions that we're told that we need. So I'm running out of time here, so I'll just end this by saying start collecting the skills you need today, right? It's, you don't need to have a chest full of tools or a huge garage or anything, right? The more that you learn little by little, of all these disparate little skills that it takes to live in a sustainable lifestyle, the better off you're going to be. So education is the key. I think that everybody, you know, needs to have these skills and needs to know them so they can transmit them on to the next generation so that we can build a permanent um, culture for the future. This concludes the five module off-grid design course series. If you've made it all the way through and you've collected the five secret letters shown on screen throughout the course of these presentations, you are entitled to receive a free printed certificate in the mail. All you need to do to apply for your certificate is go to the address shown on screen below. That's St. Paul's Free University forward slash and then the five letters which you collected. When you enter that page, you will be asked for your information so we know where to send the certificate to. For those of you that made it all the way to end this video, I'm glad to have you with us. Make sure you take the time to go to apply for the, your certificate as soon as possible because this is a limited time offer. If you'd like more information on Living Off Grid, including much more in-depth articles on all the topics that we discussed here, check out my website, offgridpermaculture.com. This has been Daniel with offgridpermaculture.com. Thanks for watching.